Blake, with that in mind, you can inquire of the witness. Thank you, Your Honor. And Ms. Gibb, sometimes we've had a hard time picking up the witnesses, so uh, the court reporter may instruct you or tell you if she's having a hard time hearing you, okay? Would you please state your name for the record? Melanie Gibb. Ms. Gibb, do you know an individual named Lori Vallow? Yes. How do you know her? Um, I met her in Arizona at a, a church event. Do you recall approximately when you met her? October 2018. And when you met her at that event, did the two of you end up uh, forming a friendship? Yes. Do you know an individual named Chad Daybell? Yes. And how do you know him? Um, I met him at some of um, different events that I've been to. Do you recall approximately when you would have met Mr. Daybell? I think I met him maybe a year or two before I met Lori. When you first met Mr. Daybell, did the two of you strike up a friendship at that time? Um, just a, a casual just introduction to each other. <laughs> Uh, after your first meeting with Mr. Daybell, did the two of you stay in contact? Um, just we, whenever we would see, it was very periodically. It was not like we communicated, you know, as friends or anything. We just if we engaged seeing each other, we might say a few words to each other, but not a, not a whole lot of contact. And after you first met Lori, did the two of you uh, continue communicating from that first meeting? Yes. Did you stay in constant contact or consistent contact? Yes. Have you ever met an, or did you ever meet an individual named Tylee Ryan? Yes. And where did you meet her? I met her at Lori's house. Do you recall approximately when that would have been? I would say a week, within a week or two after I met Lori. Did, did you ever observe Lori and Tylee together? Yes. What were you able to observe about their interactions? Um, she seemed upset and frustrated with Lori pretty much most of the time. So, and when you say she, you're referring to Tylee? Tylee, correct. Did there appear to be some tension in that relationship? Yes. Did you ever meet an individual named J.J. Vallow? I did, and yes. And where would you have met him, if you recall? Same place, her, Lori's house. Do you recall approximately when you would have met him? Within a week or two after meeting her. Did you have occasion to observe Lori and JJ's interactions with each other? I did. And what observations were you able to make of those interactions? Um, so sometimes I would watch her with him, and she was very affectionate um, and loving to him. I watched her sing a song to him as she was going to put him to bed. Um, she seemed to care a lot about him. And other times, as you know, I got to know her as time went on, um, he seemed to, you know, frustrated. Um, and so the, the connection, you know, maybe wasn't as, um, I, 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 I didn't see them interacting as much the same way. It, she was distracted a lot, so I don't know how to explain it very well, but it it was, um, she was just trying to help him, you know, trying to settle down or whatever, but. Um, so um, from your observations, JJ and Lori <coughs> appeared to interact more when you had first met JJ. Mm -hmm. Correct. And it seems like those interactions declined over time. I would say a little bit, I mean, but. And I think you indicated yeah, from yeah. your your observations, Lori was busy with some other things, or yeah, it's just distracted a lot. Distracted. <clears throat> After first meeting Lori, we've talked about that you stayed in contact with her. How often would the two of you uh, see each other? Um, sometimes it was daily or several times a week uh, in the beginning, just in the very beginning, yeah. And when you say in the very beginning, do you recall approximately how long the two of you would interact that frequently? I would say until um, January. And then when she started moving, then I'd, I didn't see her as much or talk to her as much. And when you say January, do you recall what year that would have been? 2019. 
Did you and Lori live fairly close to each other? I would say within 20, 25 minutes from each other. And did the two of you, you talked about you'd get together. Mm -hmm. Did you also speak to her over the phone during those times? Correct. Correct. Did you also message with her, uh, text message or otherwise? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gibb, I would instruct you again, if you could just wait until the question is completed before you answer, and I understand it can be nervous to be there. It's just easier for our court reporter if it's just a back and forth exchange, so thank you. And you indicated, I think, that mm -hmm. after she started moving, could you explain what, what was going on there? Um... So, so about January, um, she decided to leave, and I believe she first went to Alex's house, she, or maybe Hawaii. It was they kind of were near the same timing, so she she decided to leave um, and stay with him, and then she went to Hawaii, and then eventually she went to Texas. So she went to. Th three different places, and then she finally went back to Arizona at the very end as her stay that I knew her in Arizona. <clears throat> Do you know, uh, you indicated she'd traveled around starting in January. Do you recall when you say at the end, uh, approximately when the end was that she ended up, what time period she was moving around? So January, February, um, March, April, May, and then July, um, I know she was back when Charles was killed in July, so I know she was back in Arizona by July. So all the way from January to July, she moved around several times. And while she was moving around, did you stay in contact with her? Yes. Was that frequent contact? Do you recall approximately how often you'd speak with her or text with her? Um, it was inconsistent, but it was pretty frequent at the same time. So it wasn't like a consistent daily basis, but it was often. <clears throat> and after meeting Lori, you indicated you met her in October of 2018. Did the two of you end up taking a trip to Utah? Yes. And who else went with you? Um, there were, I don't know, about five or six ladies. Um, I can't recall all their names right now. I. And that's just yeah. fine, just what you can Yeah, I, I can't recall their names. So there were five or six ladies that mm -hmm. went to uh, Utah together. Mm -hmm. Yes. Where did you go in Utah? We went to St. George, Utah. And what were you headed there for? Was there a reason? There was a conference there. And do you recall if Chad Daybell was also at that conference? He was. Did you observe a meeting between Chad and Lori? Yes. Do you know, had they ever met before? No. Were you there when they first met? I believe so. I was, I was there with her the whole time. Mm -hmm. Did they, uh, how long was the conference that you were at? It was the weekend, so it was like a Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday most people went home. So it was that weekend. And do you recall if, Chad Daybell was there for the entirety of the conference. He was there Friday and Saturday. Were you and Lori there Friday and Saturday as well? Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. I mean, we were in the area till Sunday. We stayed at somebody's home, but the conference was Friday and Saturday. And it could have been a s Sunday evening, but I, I can't recall that right now. But he was gone by, if I remember, he was gone by Sunday morning or Saturday night, something like that. Were you able to observe Lori and Chad together throughout the time that they were both there? Yes. And what, if any, observations did you make of uh, their interactions? Uh, they were very friendly to each other, uh, very interactive, talking a lot um, about some of their ideas and beliefs that they had at that time. And so they were, um, I don't know, there was, a, there was a, a definitely attraction in the beginning, right from the beginning. So. And did you specifically observe any of Lori's actions towards Chad or how her demeanor appeared? Um, she seemed very um, interested in him, um, like someone that would meet somebody they, they're attracted to. Um, um, she seemed flattered by him um, and very enticed by the conversation and, you know, flirty-like, I would say a little flirty-like. Well. And do you know what Chad Daybell did for a living? 
Um, he was an author and a publisher and also a sexton. And had you ever read any of his books? I have. Do you know if uh, Miss Vallow Dayville had read any of his books? She had. And do you know if she'd read those books prior to meeting him? She only read, I think, just a few, um, but she hadn't read all of his books. And I don't know if she made the connections yet of who he was with the books. I, I'm not sure about that. And you indicated that y you saw them speaking and they appeared to have some shared interests? Correct. And specifically with some religion, um, some religious talk? Correct. Do you recall if they told you anything regarding uh, the two of them? Yes. And what was that? Um, he expressed to her that she, he believed that they had been um, married in multiple probations on this I'm planet. I'm going to object as to hearsay, Judge. What's the response from the state? Your Honor, it's the statement of a party opponent. Not this opponent. It's a statement of a co-conspirator. All right, I'm going to overrule the objection under Rule 801D2E that does allow statements of co-conspirators in furtherance of evidence of a conspiracy. That's how that's allowed, Ms. Blake. Uh, I would indicate, though, that I think there may be some additional foundation before uh, getting further into this issue as to whether those statements are allowed. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Gibb, did you have conversations about their first meeting with Chad Daybell? Have conversations with him? I'm sorry, I'm yes. not understanding. Did you ever speak to Chad about the first time he met Lori? Most likely, I just don't remember that exact moment. So after the first meeting, did you speak to Lori about her meeting Chad? Correct, yes. And when you were speaking with Lori, what, if anything, did she indicate to you that she and Chad had talked about with regard to the two of them? She shared with me that he told her that they had been married in another time period. And did she tell you what she believed with regard to that? She she did believe that. She, she had already had the belief system that this multiple lives, as they would call it, um, she would already believed that before she physically met him. And backing up a little bit to that, how <clears throat> had Ms. Vallow Daybell ever told you anything regarding her beliefs about a prior probation or multiple creations? She wasn't quite clear in her understanding at that point. She, she felt and she shared with me that she had um, been married to a prophet from the Book of Mormon named Moroni. And did she share this information with you before she ever met Chad Daybell? Yes. After that conference, did you end up staying in contact with Chad Daybell? Um, yes, I talked to him, or communicate somehow, period, very, very periodically, not, not very often. And I think you already indicated you and Lori would communicate quite frequently after Correct. after that. Correct. Do you know if Lori and Chad stayed in touch after that conference? Yes, they did. And how do you know that? Uh, she would tell me that they talked and how often they talked. And she, you know, I often saw her on the phone talking to him. Occasionally I could hear his voice, but she'd always indicate to me she was speaking to him.
when they first met, do you know if Lori was married? Yes. And who was she married to? Charles Vallow. Do you know if Chad was married? Yes. And who was he married to? Tammy Daybell. Do you know if their spouses were still alive? They were. And we touched uh, a little bit on the idea of multiple probations. Correct. Had, when did you first learn of that term? Um, probably when I, when I started inter- interacting with, with Lori is, is when it really began to be introduced to me. And who started to introduce that to you? Lori, and then Chad, but mostly through Lori, through Chad, he would explain it a lot more than she knew of it. So would Lori tell you that she and Chad talked about the multiple probations? Yes. And what was your understanding of what Lori and Chad believed regarding multiple probations? Um, their, their definitions changed the longer they knew each other, but in the beginning it was um, believed that in this earth you could come back multiple times, so you may live in you know, a certain earlier time in the world and then you know, several times depending on you as a person. It would be different for everybody. After Chad and Lori met in October of 2018, do you know the next time they saw each other in person? I believe it was um, two weekends later. um, He came to town for another event that was in Arizona. Did you attend that event? I did. Were both Lori and Chad present? They were. Do you recall if there was another get-together held uh, separate from the event? Yes. um, At at Lori's house, um, there was like a little um, meeting right before the conference. And do you recall where that meeting took place? At Lori's house. Did you observe Lori and Chad together during that meeting? I don't think he was there. I'm not remembering that. He could have been, but I, I, I don't remember. Did you observe Lori and Chad together during that weekend? Yes. And do you recall uh, the context of where you observed him together? So um, they were at the conference, and I saw them interacting. And then he, whatever time he arrived, he arrived at her house, and he ended up staying at her house. So your understanding was Chad stayed at Lori's house in Arizona? That's right. Do you know if Charles was present during that? I believe he was out of town. Do you know if Charles and Lori were still married at that point? They were. Do you know if Chad was still married at that point? Yes, he was. Do you recall Lori telling you anything in November regarding her, she and Chad's relationship? Yes. And what did she tell you? She told me that they had been married, um, I believe, five, five, four or five times. And she would go into different details with me about who she was, what character she was, and what character he was. Do you recall if she said anything to you about going to the temple? Yes. And what did she tell you regarding going to the temple? She would um, tell me that. Yes, that weekend that he came to Arizona, that um, they met in the temple together, and they were somewhere in there, like in just like maybe a waiting area room, um, that that they were sealed together by, I, I believe Moroni was there, and possibly, I believe she said Jesus Christ, and that they... That that relationship they had multiple lives, it was kind of like a reunited again 
they got to be sealed there. It wasn't in a, a sealing room officially done by the church or anything like that. And can you explain a little bit about the relevance of being sealed? Um, the teachings of our church talk about when you're sealed to a companion on this earth that you are for them, you are sealed for time and all eternity. And when you say the teachings of our church, are you comfortable sharing what church you're a member of? The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Did Lori share with you how she felt towards Chad at that point? Yes. And what did she tell you? Um, she told me, um, you know, they've, they very much loved each other. They loved each other, How you know, in previous mortal probations. There was a lot of affectionate feelings she had for him. Did she indicate to you anything about whether or not they were going to be open about their feelings for each other? She just shared how they felt with me. She was open with it with me. Do you know if they were sharing this information with other people? Uh, just probably people in their small group of circle. Um, I wouldn't think anybody else. Outside of multiple probations, did Chad and, well, let me back up. Did Lori ever indicate anything about having a special mission here on Earth? Yes. And what did she tell you about that? She felt that she was um, part of the 144,000. And then as she developed her relationship with Chad, she felt like they were the head leaders of it. And when you talk about the 144,000, can you explain a little bit about what that would mean? Um, it's reference from Scripture and, and Bible and, and the Doctrine and Covenants about uh, a group of 144,000 that would be here uh, during the return of our Savior, and they would help do a great mission of missionary work throughout the world. And they would have, you know, a lot of um, a spiritual endowment from on high. So, if someone were to be the head of that 144,000, would that be a pretty high calling? Absolutely. Would that be a position of pretty significant, pretty significant power? Yes. And when you talk about they may have shared this with their inner inner circle or their close friends, do you know who that would have included for them? Yes, it would have included Sulema Pest. Dennis, um, Serena, Sharp, Christina Atwood, Nicole, forgot her last name, Melanie, um, Pulowski, and I believe she told her sister mm, later on, and I don't know how much she shared with her family, I believe that's and Alex, sorry, Alex. Um, I don't believe, well, let's see. Those are the main people. And when yeah. you say Alex, uh, Alex who? Alex Cox, her brother, Lori's brother. Do you recall approximately when Lori started talking about being part of the 144,000 or the head? Of the 144,000? Right when I met her. And then I think, so, and I guess I should break this down. I kind of ask it a, yeah. I kind of ask a compound question there. Okay. So she first starts talking about being part of the 144,000 when you first meet her. Would, would that be correct? Correct. And then I think you'd already indicated after she met Chad, she indicated that she and Chad were the heads of the 144,000 or the leaders. Correct. Do you recall approximately how long after meeting Chad she started telling you that? Within weeks, probably. Do you recall 
Lori ever telling you about a light and dark scale? Yes. Did she ever explain to you what the light and dark scale was? She did. And what did she tell you regarding that? Um, she told me that people that were light were people that before they came to this planet, when we lived um, in a pre-mortal realm, basically our spirits lived there before we physically came here, um, that those that signed contracts and made agreements with the Savior were light, and those that were dark were those that signed contracts with Satan. Do you recall when she first started telling you about light and dark, the light and dark scale? It was sometime after she met Chad that few weeks um, when she met him. I would say probably pretty immediate. I, I'm, it just it feels like it was like it could have been possibly that weekend or just days after that after she met him. And when she would tell you these things, would she also essentially be teaching you about this? Correct. Did you observe her teaching any other people these things? Yes. And do you recall who else you observed her teach these things to? Um, I saw her teach them to um, the girls that I mentioned earlier, and her brother, and, and just a few other friends that I did podcast with. Did the teachings about light and dark evolve over time? They did. What else did Lori end up telling you regarding someone that was dark? I'm sorry, repeat that again. What else did Lori tell you regarding someone that was dark? Um, at, at first it was, you know, they were working under the contract of Satan, and so they were more on that dark side, um, and then it would change, you know, you know, often more and more. But um, yeah. Could someone switch from being light to dark or dark to light? I believe so. I believe that's my memory, yes. And when, just backing up a little bit, when we talk about that inner circle, do you recall if Brandon Boudreaux was part of that circle? Do you mean like sharing the beliefs with? Yes. Or, no, we didn't share. She didn't share or Chad didn't share with her, with him, any of that information that I know of. I mean, she could have, but I don't remember it. Do you recall Brandon ever being at any uh, meetings or gatherings where you were there? I don't recall that. Did you ever talk to Brandon about anything Lori was telling you? Um, no, no not, not, not during my friendship with Lori, no. What about Charles Vallow? Was he present for any of the teachings or the gatherings or the meetings? No. Do you believe that Lori would have considered him part of an inner circle? No. Did Lori ever tell you anything with regard to an individual being possessed? Yes. And what did she tell you regarding that? So my first experience with her sharing that with me was um, she was, I recall she was in, I believe it was the second house that I met her in. So it was probably, you know, that January time of 2019. And she first started telling me she was in the backyard of her house. She came in and she started sharing all the information she just heard from Chad. Chad let her know that Charles Vallow was um, taken over by an evil spirit. And that was the first time she had heard of it. And, and then, you know, that made him dark, according to them. And that was in January of 2019? I believe that is correct. Did Lori talk to you about uh, a dream she had had? Yes. And what did she tell you regarding a dream she had around that time? So she she shared with me that Charles was, he was getting ready to go to Texas, and I don't know if he was there already, but 
that she had saw him in a car accident. I believe JJ might have been with him in the car accident, um, but that he he died in it, and so he would not be coming back home by January first. And do you know if JJ was with Charles during that time? He was. And do you know if JJ would have been traveling back with Charles? Yes, he was. Do you know if Charles was in an accident at that time? He was not. Did you ever talk to Lori about the fact Charles was not in an accident? Yes, I did. What did she tell you regarding that? I asked her what happened. You you know, you shared that you thought he was going to pass away. And she said he didn't because Satan interfered with the plan. And when she talked about the plan, did she tell you whose plan it was? She would talk about um, just from her own experiences. Often she would either have what she would call revelation about different experiences with Charles, or maybe she would, and also she would also talk about her experiences um, with Chad and and how they envision getting together that their spouses would pass away so that that was the plan that was revealed to them they believed um, that their spouses would pass away with the idea being that once their spouses passed away they could be together correct Based on what Lori was telling you, was it your understanding as well, because Charles was dark, he would need to pass away? Correct. Do you recall Lori ever talking to you about castings? Yes. What did she tell you regarding castings? Um, So she would um, say that she was trying to understand how to get these evil spirits out, and so her attempt to do that was to have like a a prayer where she would um, like you maybe would read from the scriptures where you would um, try to encourage the spirit to come out by the power of God when did you ever participate in any castings or observe them yes do you recall when that would have been Approximate, if you can remember. Probably January, February 2019 is my after you know she learned that Charles was dark. So sometime after that. And I apologize because you may have already said this, but was Charles the first individual that you ever heard Lori call dark? Yes. Do you recall where that casting would have taken place? The first time I recall was uh, at Sulema's house. Do you recall who was present for that? Um, Lori, Sulema, Christina, Nicole, Serena, and me. And those are some of the same individuals you'd previously mentioned, is that correct? Yes, yes. And you talked about castings being kind of a prayer. Mm -hmm. Was there any other element to the castings? Um, I guess so. Um, It was definitely... Uh, out of context for what I would, you know, see anybody talk about on a spiritual level in any religion, but they would use terminology that to me sounded kind of like energy work, and so they would try to um, share words like um, disconnect their cords, like a cord was something you connect your spirit to your body, something like that. Um, they use different elements and words. I. I didn't use those type of words. I just talked about, you know, my relationship with Christ. And so I I don't recall exactly how everybody spoke those words, but it was their attempt to help um, convince the spirit to leave the body. And so to back up a little bit, when we talk about to convince the spirit to leave the body, would that be the evil spirit or the presence that had come in, or would yeah. that be the actual individual spirit it would be this the the spirit that took over that particular person's body 
do you know, do you, or do you recall what Lori told you regarding where the original spirit from that body was? Um, in the beginning it was, um, they would be, I, I believe it was in, they were either in the spirit world or spirit prison, I can't remember in the beginning, um, that that's where, um, or they would, they would be stuck sometimes between this world and that world. It, it kind of changed a lot, so I'm sorry if it's I'm not real accurate. But I, it was either they were on the other side that they had moved on in the spirit world, or either somehow they were stuck or something like that. And you're just fine. I'm just asking yeah. for what you recall. Okay. Um, and I recognize it's been some time. Yeah. With regard, so. What she told you, though, is the original spirit is out of the body. Correct. The physical body is still alive. Correct. And another entity or spirit is in that body. Correct. Do you recall what she told you regarding if the other spirit, the evil spirit, the entity is cast out of the body, what would happen to the body? So the first time they were able to, they thought they were able to cast out this first spirit that took over Charles's body, whose name was Ned, um, when that spirit left, so they weren't sure how it worked. And so after they believed Ned left, then they would they would see that Charles was still alive. And then they would come up with another idea that maybe another spirit, and then they come up with another name that that all that spirit was the one that took over his body. And when you say they would come up with this wasn't something that you were told all at once then? Oh, no. So as time went on, teachings evolved? Absolutely. And you refer to when Ned leaves Charles' body, another entity or spirit comes in? Correct. Did they give that a name that you recall, or did Lori yes. ever refer to that entity by any name? Yes. And what was that? The, after Ned, it was Garrick, I believe. Garrett, maybe Garrett. And then what happened with regard to Garrett? Then he supposedly was cast out. And then after that, another one, if I think it's the final one, was he blo something like he blows, something like that. And I think you, you said you participated in a few castings. <clears throat> Did you participate in any other castings regarding Charles? Uh, yeah, that was several with Charles, yes. Mm -hmm. Were those castings done as new spirits would come in? Yes. Do you recall if Lori indicated whether or not the original spirit could ever come back into the body? No, I, I don't recall that. Do you recall if they told you anything, if they, or excuse me, I say they, do you recall if Lori ever used the term zombie? Yes. Do you recall approximately when she used that term? It wasn't in the beginning, but I would say weeks, weeks after the original idea that someone taken over the body, they just started calling, using that terminology. Uh, I would just say weeks after that. And with that, you talked about participating in several castings on Charles. And we yes. talked about who was at the first one. Do you recall if it was the same individuals at the next casting? Um, there could have been different, I mean, not different people generally, but just maybe less of the, the group. I know that there was another lady, but I don't even remember her name anymore. But I think she was there very shortly. Do you recall if Lori was present for all of the castings you were at? Yeah. Yes. And was she present? Yes. Just wanted to make that clear. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you recall if Chad was present at any of the castings? Um, I can recall one. It could have been more, but I can recall one. And the one that you recall Chad at, was that a casting for Charles? Charles had already passed away. It was right after his death. Do you recall which cast, who else you did castings for or participated in castings? Um, I'm not quite sure. I, it's, it feels like it could have been Brandon Boudreaux, but I, that's, that's what I can remember. 
Do you recall if Lori ever told you that Brandon Boudreaux was dark? Yes. Do you recall if she ever told you whether or not he had an evil spirit in him? Yes. And did she indicate that he did have an evil spirit? She did. Do you recall if Lori told you anything else about Brandon Boudreaux? Yes, so it evolved. So he was, um, I believe he was dark from the beginning. I could be wrong on that, but I'm, that's what my, my, my recollection. And then, then he became a very high level dark. So the, the darkness kind of evolved into like they had multiple lives as well. And, and he was supposedly, um, part of Hitler's group during that regime. Um, so it, he just kind of got, it just evolved like that. Do you recall if you participated in castings for any other individuals? I don't recall. And we've, if, I think you indicated the casting that Chad participated at would have been after Charles passing? Yes. So to the best of your recollection, would that have been the one for Brandon Boudreaux? That's, that's what my recollection is. And outside of the castings, were you ever told that anyone else was dark? Yes. Do you recall who else you were told was dark? Um, so it was Charles. That was Brandon. Um, her brother, not Alex, but another brother of hers. Eventually her dad. Um, and then Tylee, then Kay, then at the very end, JJ. Um, and I'm sh and just random people that I can't recall, but those are the ones that I'm recalling at this moment. Do you recall if you were ever told anything by Lori about Tammy's, whether she was light or dark? If she was considered dark, it was right before she passed, so. Were you ever told, with regard to Tylee being dark, did Lori ever tell you whether or not an evil spirit had entered Tylee? Yes. Do you recall approximately when that would have been? I was... I sometime between probably February or March to June is somewhere I believe when she was in Texas she maybe she shared with me when she was in Texas which you probably can recall better when she was in Texas than I can but it's probably like in May or April whenever she was there that's what it feels like that's what it was do you recall approximately when well actually let me back up did she ever tell you if J.J. was taken over or possessed by an evil spirit? Yes, <clears throat> she did. And do you recall approximately when that would have been? Um, so, oh, wait, sorry, I'm getting my... Septem was it September 2019? Was that when I was... Yeah, se yeah, September, tw yeah, two th yeah, September. In 2019? Yeah. And was that the first time you'd heard of J.J. being possessed? Yes. And you'd mentioned that there was a casting done after Charles had passed away. Do you know when Charles passed away? I believe it was July 11th, 2019. And you indicated previously, I believe, that Lori had talked about how both Charles and Tammy were supposed to pass away. Correct. Do you know what she told you regarding Tammy passing away? She learned from Chad that he knew years ago that she would be passing away, you know, early in her life. I believe you already testified that 
Lori had moved back to Arizona before Charles passed away. Correct. Were you in contact with Lori when she came back to Arizona? Yes. Did you, in fact, stay at her house in July of 2019? I did. Do you recall what day you stayed at her house? Um, it was, I believe, the 10th or the night. I spent the night and night, 10th, 10th, I th something like that. Around the 9th or 10th? Yeah. yeah. At, at some point, did were you going to stay there longer? No, I just periodically um, stayed with her, but... I, I didn't have a, like agenda or anything. After uh, you had left, do you know if anyone else ended up staying the night at her residence? Yes, I was told Alex was coming the next morning or the next day. Do you know if that would have been the night before Charles died? Right, correct. Did Lori tell you why she was going to have Alex stay there? She told me that he um, needed to stay there to protect her because Charles was, was going to kill her. Did Lori ever tell you how Charles died? She did. What did she tell you? She told me that when he came into the house, um, he was argumentative with her. She had JJ in the car. She had her, no, his, his cell phone. She told me his cell phone was in the car that JJ was in and that she said that the spirit told her to pick up the phone and grab it. She ran into the house and he was really angry that he took her phone and they were yelling and screaming. He was threatening her. She told me and Tylee came out with a baseball bat and she told me to protect herself or her mom or felt the need to protect them and that it got heated, the conversation. Then Alex um, interacted with him and it became very argumentative. Uh, he said that he went to get his gun to protect them and then he shot him. And when you say he shot him, who shot Charles? Alex. Did Lori tell you whether or not she witnessed the shooting? I don't think so. Did she indicate that she was present for the altercation? Yes. Do you recall if Chad Daybell ended up visiting sometime after Charles' death? Yes. Do you recall approximately when that would have been? I would say within a week or two. I don't, I don't recall the time or day. Did you observe Chad and Lori together when he visited after Charles' death? Yes. Did you, were you able to make any observations as to how Chad seemed? They both seemed very happy. And when you say they both, was that Chad and Lori? Correct. And when we talk, um, you talked about she took his phone. Are you referring to who is the she? Lori said she grabbed his and when you Charles's say, phone, cell phone. Did Lori tell you where Tylee was during the shooting? I just know she was around. I, I don't recall her expressing. I, I could she could have. I just I can't recall it right now who was present. I I just know Alex was. Do you recall if she told you where JJ was during the shooting? It my my memory seems to be either he was in the car or I know at some point she she took him somewhere, but that might have been afterwards. I just don't recall right now. Did anyone make any indication to you regarding feelings of Charles being dead? No, I mean, you mean like sad feelings or? Yeah, any indication of, of feeling sad? The appearance was not sad. 
Did anyone indicate it, indicate being happy or relieved that Charles was deceased? Uh, if there was a portray, um, portray of happiness and excitement, yeah. Prior to Charles passing, do you know if Chad and Lori had stayed in contact with each other? Yes. Do you know how frequently they would communicate? Multiple times a day, that is my understanding. Did you ever observe Lori with more than one cell phone? Yes. Do you recall approximately how many cell phones you had seen her with? At least two, maybe three. Did she ever tell you what she used those phones for? She had one phone just for Chad and then her regular cell phone and I can't remember. Seemed like she got another one. Did you ever, did, did Lori ever tell you whether or not she and Chad would meet up? Would ever meet uh, while Charles was still alive? Um, yes. Did she tell you where they would meet? Um, one time she said they, um, after visiting her or before, during, no, right after I visited her in Texas, she was to meet with him and I believe they were in a hotel according to my memory and they were to go to temples together. That's what she said. Um, there was another time she left town but she indicated she went to Salt Lake, but my guess is she, she didn't. I, I don't know. She indicated she went to Salt Lake, so I don't know if they met up there or what, what happened there. She didn't tell me if they got together there. But I don't know if Jack moved a strike. It looks like this is speculation. She doesn't know what, what Lori did. I will sustain that objection, so I'll instruct the jurors to please dis, uh don't consider that previous response as to the speculative answer. Did Lori ever tell you directly that she and Chad would meet at hotels or motels? Yes. And did they actually meet at, did she tell you that they met at hotels? Yes. Did she tell you that they would meet at motels? I don't remember the wording exactly. One of the two? Yeah, right. Did Lori ever indicate to you whether or not she and Chad were engaged in an affair? She would just share that they were intimate. Was this while Charles was still alive? Yes. Was this while Tammy was still alive? Yes. Did Lori indicate whether or not she thought it was okay that they were engaging in intimate relations? She did. She, she felt it was, it was um, according to God's will. And did she tell you ever expand on why she believed it was according to God's will? Yes. She explained that because they had been married in multiple lives and they had a mission together, that it was okay. And when we talk about her having a mission, did she ever talk to you about her mission to lead the 144,000 in relation to her children? She indicated that she was um, a part of that group, the 144,000. And at some point, everybody in her family would pass on just because of tribulations. Um, at some point, she shared that with me, probably in the very beginning. Did Lori ever indicate any concerns to you about her ability to continue to care for JJ? Um... I believe, you know, just right before um, he was killed, I, you know, he, she just indicated he was um, difficult to to handle, and so it was hard for her to do that and to be with Chad. So something in that communication like that. Did she ever indicate a desire to? quit caring for J.J. or to get rid of him? Uh, she, she did. And what did she indicate to you? She indicated that um, she was going to ask Kay if he could, if she could um, watch him from now on.
And going back a little bit, when was the last time that you saw Tylee? Um, July, between July, whenever they, before they left to Idaho. So she left, I think, in October, September, um, August. I don't know, July or August, whenever, right before, probably they left to go up to Idaho. And uh, do you recall approximately when they left to go to Idaho? Um, maybe August, beginning of August 2019. And when you say they, do you know who went to Idaho? Lori, Tylee, JJ. And what? Alex. Alex went up there, too. And when you say Alex went up there, too, do you recall if he moved at the same time as Lori? Around the same time. It seemed like he might have gotten there maybe a week. I know she went to visit to find a, an apartment. It, it seems like he might have been there a week or so before. I, I'm just, I, I know it's just around the same time. Once she left to Idaho, did you ever speak to Lori on the phone? I did. When you would talk to her on the phone, did you ever hear Tylee or JJ or speak to one of them? I, I heard Tylee in the background. Do you recall if that was close in time to their move? They were already moved in in their apartment in Idaho. After seeing Tylee before they moved, did you ever see Tylee again? No. Did you ever travel to Idaho to where Lori was living? I did. Do you recall approximately when that was? In September, middle of the month. And why did you travel up there? Um, a few reasons. Um, she asked me to come up. Um, another reason is um, there was a seminar that I was interested in going to around not too far from her home. And also me and... Um, my boyfriend at the time, um, we're going to see his son as well when we were passing through. When you came to Idaho, did you end up staying at Lori's residence? I did. Did David also stay at Lori's residence? He did. When you got there, did you see Tylee? No. Did you ask Lori where Tylee was? I did. What did Lori tell you? She told me that she was at BYU, and she moved her in with some female friends or people, you know, at the dorms or somewhere at night, you know, BYU campus. And do you recall how long you were in Idaho? Um, I believe a Thursday to a Monday morning. While you were there, did you ever see Tylee? No. Did you ever hear anyone speak to Tylee? No. Did Lori make any other reference to Tylee while you were there? I asked about her belongings. They weren't in, I didn't see them. She said she put them in storage. Um, she really didn't talk about her much. Did you see JJ when you were there? I did. Did Lori talk to you about J.J. while you were there? She did. What did she tell you about J.J.? When I first arrived, she let me know that she said that J.J. had now had an evil spirit in him. She had learned it from the, like the day before. Did she indicate how she knew that he had an evil spirit? She said that she always went to chat about this information, and he would share it with her when it would happen. Did she indicate whether or not she'd made any observations regarding the behaviors of J.J.? She did. And what did she tell you? She would tell me his um, behavior was more difficult, and she would tell me his speech was more intelligent, and she would tell me he would say things 
like, I love Satan. Um, she told me his, um, he would, you know, climb up on the refrigerator and go top of the, um, the cabinets and he was acting, um, just more aggressive, more, uh, she just, she just tried to, um, explain how she believed he was changing and more of a negative type of, um, a demeanor, I guess. Was this the first time that Lori had talked to you about someone changing once they were dark or possessed? No. And who else had she indicated had behavior or physical changes? Um, I remember Charles. She, she indicated he looked different. Um, I just not remembering all the details, but she would say some things about um, their behaviors. She would share, like maybe they would just talk to her differently. Do you recall approximately how many times before that interaction or that visit that you would have seen JJ? Um, I saw him a handful of times. I haven't tried to figure it out. Um, maybe 10 or 15 times in his life. I'm, I'm not sure. Based on the times that you'd been able to observe him, did you notice any changes in JJ? No. Did he appear to be a typical seven-year-old? A, a typical seven-year-old autistic kid. And when you say a typical seven-year-old autistic kid, do you have experience with autistic children? Um, to some level. And so you're aware or you've observed some behaviors before? Mm -hmm. Yes. Did, and JJ's behavior seemed consistent with any autistic seven-year-old? Yes. That you've observed? Yes. Did you ever see JJ climbing on counters or the ceiling? No. Nope. While you were there, did you ever observe JJ act out? Um, he seemed very upset one day, and so Chad uh, took him upstairs um, and went into a bedroom with him, according to Chad. And you were there at the, towards the mid to end of September, is that what you said? Um, so the, the day I left, I believe, was September 23rd. So the, the Thursday before that. And Charles had passed away? Correct. Do you know if Tammy was still alive? She was. And you mentioned Chad being there? Yes. Was Chad there for the duration of your visit? He would come in and out. Do you know if he stayed the night while you were there? No. Um, and I'll clarify that. No, you don't know or no, he did not. He No, he did not. So when J.J. acted out, it was Chad, not Lori, that took him upstairs. Correct. And when Chad came, did Chad come back down from taking him upstairs? She, he did. Was J.J. with him? I think so. What did Chad say regarding that? He just quietly came down and I asked him why his neck was so red. And he said that J.J. had scratched his neck. Did you have occasion to observe Chad and Lori during that visit? I did. Did you observe their interactions with each other? I did. What did you observe? Um, they're affectionate. Um, he consoled her. He would kiss her on the cheek, um, hug her. And they had, you know, fun together singing and dancing too. Did they appear fairly affectionate? Yes. Do you recall going to walk a track with them? I do. And what, if anything, did you observe when you went to do that? Um, walked around the track with them, and at, and then we went downstairs, and they showed me some beautiful pictures in the 
one of the hallways at the campus. And then at the end, as we got in the car, Lori and I got in her car, and then he got in his car. They were affectionate. He hugged her and gave her a kiss. Do you recall if you were told anything regarding the secrecy of Chad and Lori's relationship? Yes. And what were you told? Um, Chad had indicated to David that weekend that, you know, he'd appreciate if he didn't share it with anybody about the relationship. Um, he probably talked about it like that, but I can recall that moment. And were you present for that conversation? Yes. During that conversation, I th did you indicate that was a conversation mainly between Chad and David? Yes. Did you overhear it? Chad say anything else regarding Tammy? Um, he said that he was still married to her and she was, it, I wasn't paying attention to the whole conversation, so, and I don't recall the whole conversation. Um, it, he could have talked about how she was a good wife. I, I can't remember if David told me that or she did, but anyway, that's what it feels like, he said. Do you know, has Lori ever indicated to you if the date September 22nd has any kind of special meaning? Yes. And what has she indicated to you? Um, she indicated to me that that was the date that Moroni appeared to her in a, in a temple. Do you recall the last time you saw JJ? Um, I recall seeing him... Um, the Sunday night when he was being taken upstairs by Alex in his bedroom, that's the last time I recall seeing him. And do you know what date that was? I believe that was the 22nd. Were you still there the next, you left on that next month, or the following day, the Monday? Correct. Correct. Did you see JJ that next day? I did not. I don't recall seeing him. Did Lori say anything to you about JJ? Um, I don't remember her talking to me about him, uh, other than she was talking about some of his behaviors and things like that. <clears throat> Prior to Charles dying, did Lori ever talk to you at all about life insurance? <clears throat> A little bit. Do you recall what she told you? Um, specifically, I remember um, we were we were in her kitchen after Charles passed. Uh, no, right before he yeah, right before he came to town. Um, she told I said why why would he want to kill you? And she said, well, I have you know I think she said a million or a few million dollars of insurance on her that he wanted that, but then she said she found out that he had changed the policy and um, a lot of that money to his sister Kay. So a lot of the money, if Lori died, would go to Kay, according to her? If, if, if um, sorry, maybe I got it confused. Um, if Charles passed away, then the money would go to Kay. That's, sorry, that's, that's what I meant to say. And do you recall when she told you she had learned that? Um, it, it felt like that was the first time. I could, that's, I recall that being the first time we talked about it, um, the day before he, he was killed. Did you ever talk to Lori about why she didn't just get a divorce? Yes. What did she tell you? She told me, um, that that was not the Lord's will for them to get a divorce because, um, it seemed, Especially when I asked about Chad getting divorced, it seemed that it, it, the Lord didn't want him to because he would be penalized for that. And did do you know what they meant, or did they ever explain to you what they would be penalized meant? Um, I recall her saying that he would lose his exaltations or his something to that effect as his exaltations or his standing with God.
Did you ever see JJ again after the night of September 22nd? I don't recall seeing him. Did you ever return to visit Lori in Idaho after that visit? No, no. Did you stay in contact with Lori? Yes. Did you speak to her frequently, occasionally? Do you remember? Occasionally. Uh, what about Chad? Did you stay in contact with him? Oh, yes. I mean, well, he contacted me, but I didn't contact him that I could recall. Do you recall any specific times that Chad contacted you? Yes. Um, it seemed like it was a few days in November before Thanksgiving, and he called me when I was in Utah, and he told me that the Rexburg police would be calling to not answer the phone. Did he expand on that as to why he didn't want you to answer the phone? Well, I had to ask him a few questions. And what did he tell you? Um, he said that um, that the police were questioning at Lori's apartment where JJ was. And then I asked him, I said, he's not with Kay? And he said, no, he's not. And he had a nervous voice and... I asked him if he was, and he said yes. And he told me that Lori would be contacting me shortly after that. And you say you asked Chad if JJ was with Kay. Mm -hmm. Why did you ask him that? Because that's what I was told. That's where he went. So why would Kay be looking for him if Kay was, had JJ? Do you recall who told you that he was with Kay? Lori did. Did Lori tell you how she got JJ into Kay's custody? She said they met at the airport and they met together and she asked him, she asked her to um, watch JJ. Do you recall approximately when Lori told you that? Um, I would say within a few weeks of after I left, I don't. I don't recall. And when you say after you left, are you referring to that September, September visit? September, correct. Did Lori, in fact, reach out to you? I believe it's possible. I reached out to her and asked her. What did Lori say to you? She told me that she met up with her with Kay in the airport. And that she told her that she had cancer and that she needed for JJ to be watched. And he, she said, okay. And that, that was the gist of it. And to the best of your understanding, Lori's indication was Kay had agreed to take JJ. Correct. And going forward to the date that Chad called and asked you not to speak with law enforcement, did Lori, in fact, reach out to you? She did. What did she say? Um, she said that um, the police had come by, and she told the police that I had JJ. She told me to go to that. I uh, she told the police that I was I took JJ to a movie called Frozen, I believe, and just take random pictures of kids running around at the movie theater. Was JJ with you? No. Did law enforcement try to reach out to you? They did. Did you pick up or respond to them initially? Not initially. And why did you not respond to them initially? I wasn't sure what in the world to do. Had Lori told you anything previously regarding law enforcement? Um, she... Um, I'm not sure at this point when she shared with me, but she told me that they were dark and that they were, you know, after her, like Satan was after her with the other dark entities that they talked about. So they had become, they call them tra dark translated beings, I believe. But I, I don't know exactly when she shared that with me, but at some point she did. Did she tell you anything about other people being after her? Kay and her brother, her father, and... I think 
And her brother, would that have been Alex Cox? No, uh, no, her other brother. I forgot his name. So when Chad's called and asked you not to speak to law enforcement and then Lori's called you, you don't answer law enforcement right away because you're not sure what to do. Right. She told me, um, I forgot to share this, she told me that, that JJ's life was in danger, that Kay was um, trying to kidnap him from her. That's what she shared with me. <clears throat> and did you believe her? Um, I wasn't sure. I was more perplexed and probably in shock a bit. Had you believed things Lori had shared with you before? At times, yes. Was she still a friend of yours at that point? Yes. When you initially made contact with law enforcement, or I should ask, did you eventually speak with law enforcement? Yes, I end up talking to Officer Pillar from Gilbert, Arizona. And the first time you had contact with law enforcement, did you in fact indicate JJ was with you? I, how I shared it with him, as I said, I had him, but then I didn't have him anymore. That Lori had him. That's how I kind of talked about it. And had you ever had JJ with you? No. And why at that time did you relay that to law enforcement? Um, I wasn't 100% sure she was telling the truth or not, and I felt in a very weird and uncomfortable position, and I really did not know what to do. Regrettably, I didn't share exactly how I wanted to. At some point, did you end up making contact with law enforcement at a later date? Yes. Do you recall approximately when that was? Um... I feel like it was just the very beginning of December, probably, or the very end of November, somewhere in that time. At that time, did you tell law enforcement that J.J. had never been with you? Oh, yeah. Did you share with them what you knew? Yes. And Judge... I'll indicate, I'm getting close to the point of asking to admit an exhibit that's about 20, a little over 20 minutes long. If that is admitted and published, I don't know if you'd like to take a mid-morning break now or continue through that. Let's go ahead and uh, go forward now and take the break. It, it's how long, 20 minutes? A little over 20 minutes. Okay, uh, let's keep going at this point. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Gibb, did you share a recording with law enforcement at some point? I did. When was that recording made? I believe sometime in December, the beginning of December. Was it a recording of a conversation that you were party to? Yes. Who else is on that call? Um, Lori and Chad and myself. Did you, in fact, make the recording? I did. And if you were to hear a portion of that recording, do you believe that you would be able to recognize that? Yes. Your Honor, I have what's marked as States Exhibit 42. I would ask to be allowed to play a portion of that for identification purposes. Any objection? Your Honor, I'm not sure if we're just going to play a portion of it or the entire the entire conversation. We would rather that the court... Play, uh, that the uh, court hear the entire conversation. The portion was just simply to lay foundation, I think, for identification purposes. If the defense will stipulate to the admission, uh, I'm happy to play the full thing. I, it was just for identification purposes. I didn't know if we wanted her oh, to yeah. identify it first. I think we've all heard it. Well, both sides have heard it. Uh, if it's not what it purports to be, I'll certainly object right at the beginning. Okay. And why don't we just get it started? You can pause it and lay that identification foundation. I'll confirm again whether or not the defense then objects to it being admitted. Thank you, counsel.
morning on December 8th at 3.43 p.m. And I am calling Cade Bell's phone number, and hopefully I will be talking to both of them, Jed and Lori. So here goes the phone call. All right, Ms. Blake, can you pause it at that point? Thank you. Um, so, again, to lay that foundation of identification, Mr. Thomas, you indicate you previously reviewed this exhibit. Do uh, you have any concerns going forward that this is the correct exhibit you've previously reviewed? No, Your Honor, this is the exhibit that we were anticipating. All right. Uh, is there any objection? Then 42 needs to be admitted before published, so it's been moved to be admitted. Does the defense object to uh, the admission of Exhibit 42? No, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So, Ms. Blake, apologies for the interruption. You can publish this now. And I will just make the record, so for defense and the court's benefit, I have that the total duration is going to be 21 minutes and 53 seconds. Okay, thank just you, Just so Blake. that comports with counsel's copy. It does. All right, it can be published at this time, and it is admitted.
not be found. So what does that mean? Time out on your laptop. Also, that nobody has to be worried about it. I mean, nobody has to be yeah. questioned about it, so he can be safe. Yeah, so are you, I mean, are you, how, how long are you going to be away for? Like, how, I mean, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? Or are you going to keep, you know, like, come back? I mean, like, what does that look like? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day, so. Okay. I just wondered if I was ever going to see you again. Absolutely, you will. Okay, so yep. so maybe when they're done chasing you, you'll be able to come out of, maybe you'll come out again, or? Yeah, I mean, it's a ridiculous thing for them to be working with Kay to find me. There's nothing that's gone on that's. You know what I'm saying? Like, they're working with her in some dark capacity. The police are working with her in some mm-hmm. dark capacity. There's no reason for them to be after me mm-hmm. in the first place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, has she, has she threatened you at all? Yes, lots of times. Oh, boy. What did she, what did she say? Well, it's in emails and everything. Oh. So, like, she said she was going to take them, or she was... There's a lot of things. Yeah. Nelly. Well, that sounds like it. I'm just worried for you guys because, you know, he's missing, and, you know... I know exactly where he is. He's perfectly fine. Okay, well, I hope so. I I have a scripture I wanted to share with you, if you don't mind. I love it. I was thinking about some of the things you guys have gone through, and I saw the scripture today, and I wanted to... Let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question about the scripture. Okay. So, did Alma turn himself into King Noah, or what was he required to be? Well, King Noah was incredibly wicked. Yes. So he he fled his his evil ways, which which was adultery and... And right, living riotously and breaking all the commandments. Right. So what did he? Commandments. What was he required to do, Alma? He had to go and flee so that he would um, be safe and then help other people realize how you know jacked up the system was and the government was. What about Moroni? What was he required to do at the end? To to carry on those plates and bury them. No, so what did he have to do to do that? What did he have to do to do that? He had to hide. He had to hide because they were so. Um, oh. They were so. Um, everybody's killing everybody in the society. Everybody was dying. They were killing all the natives. He in the scriptures had to hide in the cavity of a rock by day and go out by night. The, prophet, said, the prophets. The prophets did. They did. Yeah. Okay. So, so I thank you for sharing that with me. Okay. I just uh, this scripture is just something that may be thoughtful for you. For behold, this is Dr. Kevin, section 3, verse 7 and 8, says, For behold, you should not have feared man nor the God, although men set not the counsels of God and despise his words. Yet you should have been faithful, and he would have extended his arm and supported you against all the fiery darts of the adversary. He would have been with you in every trouble. So when we work with the Lord and are obedient, he has... He's going to protect us from adversarial darts and all kinds of negativity. But when we open the door to Satan, he comes in, and then he attacks. And then he takes away to make it look like somebody else took it away. But that's not how God works. He doesn't work in darkness. I agree with you 100%. And that's what the Lord is doing for me. Exactly what he's doing for me. Oh, just... just, uh, We can't talk about the door for darkness now. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. And I promise you that I have done nothing wrong in this case, but sometimes you have to hide in a cavity of a rock for your own life safety. And that's what the Lord requires of you sometimes. And that's how it is. And I'm sorry that's how it is because there is a lot of darkness on the earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. This has after me for Zero reason besides the darkness of Kay, which you already know she's dark. I, I, I haven't met her enough to know if she's dark or not. I've just met her slightly, and she 
seem like a normal kind of person, but then I haven't engaged with her that much, so I don't know that personally. So you don't know about her changing the thing to for herself to be the beneficiary of the policy and all that stuff? None of that's dark, right? Well, I haven't seen those documents, so I have no way of knowing. You've seen them on my computer? No, I have not. I haven't even looked at on your computer before. Yeah, I don't you're being controversial to me or if you're recording this conversation for the police or whatever. I don't know what your intention is on this phone call. Well, but uh, with all my heart, and I have forever, and well, I will always be. I appreciate those words, but if you really loved me, you wouldn't have told the police that I had JJ with me. That's not that's not what a friend does. And that just makes me look weird, and it, it just... It's not safe for me. That doesn't look good. You know, you had to think of my welfare if you loved me. I do, and I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you, and I love you. And I I don't do anything to harm you. And you can have all of this confirmed to you by the Lord. I have. And my, my conscience is clear. I feel very understanding what's really going on, Lori. And I believe that, look, I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan. I believe that he has tricked you. And I just, I don't believe that what you're doing is correct. I just don't, I mean, Tammy dies, and then your husband died, and then he's, and then he's missing. It just doesn't sound like God's plan to me. It just sounds, it gives me a gut feeling, like in my gut, it feels weird, it doesn't feel right, I don't have peace about it, I never have felt 100% peace about it, I always felt like a little weird in my stomach about all these things. You know me, Mel. You know me. This does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear, and have fear of the celestial world. I don't have fear. You obviously do. No, I have a piece of conscience and I can see clearly. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way. I love you so much. I love you too. Thank you. 
No, the, the, you know what? I have, I have come to understand that my gut feeling, I was not listening to it. And I always felt uncomfortable with uh, many things. Okay. Well, I'm sorry that I included you in those teachings then for your own sake because I wish that you didn't have as much knowledge as you have because you will be accountable for the knowledge that you do have, no? So are you. I so agree 100%. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I have no fear. Yeah. I have no fear of that. But I oh, really, uh, you know, so I, was, I was reading the story of Cora Cora. And it's so very similar to this, you just can't see it. But he did it because he was trying to reclaim a people, and he thought at the very end, because of his carnal and natural desires, that's what influenced him. And he was very, very... Carnal and natural desires? Well, honey, you got a lot of natural desires. We all know that. That's what you think is me, Carnal Are you kidding me right now? I think both of you have had similar, right similarities. It's in the scriptures. It's in the scriptures. And the scriptures are very powerful. Yes, they are. I live by the scriptures, as you know. I know, but we can rest the scriptures for our own vain glory. So I rest in the scriptures? We can. We can do that. And I feel that you have. I thought... Our, our belief systems. Do I rest the scriptures? Is that what you're accusing me of at this point? I feel that you have. How? Why do you feel that way? I need an explanation on this. Because if you look, like the scripture just said, okay, you read the scripture every single day. You okay. know, uh, I, oh, I know you read it. I don't know that. But, but the scripture right here says that you will be supported by all against the fiery darts of the adversary. You would have been supported if you had not opened dark portals and dark junk. You would have been safe. If you would have obeyed God, he would have had your back. But you have been chased and tortured. I don't know if you do this or not. I'm sorry? He has your back. So. Well, if he has your back, you would not not be able to tell me where you are. And we couldn't find JJ. Like, where is he? I've been asking, where is he? And you know what I mean? Like, that's. I can tell everything where JJ is right now. And that would not be good, JJ. So I'm sorry that you don't want me to protect my children. But I would never ask you to not protect your children. Of course you wouldn't. So I can tell that you're just adversarial, Mel. I love you. I'm sorry that you feel no, this way. This because I actually do care. I'm sharing what I feel for you because I know your salvation's in trouble for what you've done. And my salvation is not in trouble at all. And I think you should check that with the Lord again. Well, I, I, I felt a lot of things from the Lord. And this doesn't feel right. Well, I'm sorry that you feel that way, sweetheart. I'm sorry that you are friends with all those who are against me. Joseph Smith's friends turned I'm not, against me. I'm not, a friend. I'm not friends with people that are against you. Apparently you are. I am not. I don't know Kay. I don't know who you're talking about. Your sister, I don't even know what her name or who she is. I don't know any of those people. Why would they contact me anyway? How would I even know about that? Well, you're friends with Dave, and he's well, apparently, well, you know. Well, David is a very righteous man, and um, I've always known that grounding about him. And he has a lot of beautiful experiences with the Lord, and these are not the same. You know, when you get the priesthood, it's Peter, James, and John shows up, and then he confirms all of those in the circle that are to get it, and everybody's a witness of that. Everybody's a witness that the pattern is in the scriptures. There's no witness that you ever receive what you think you receive. Nobody has seen that but you. There's no witness. The witness, Joseph Smith, Oliver Calvary, Martin Harris, the eight witnesses, they all showed up. Is there a witness that Jesus, Heavenly Father, gave that Joseph Smith by himself in the grove was their witness? No, but they had no. it later with other people. That was one experience, but others joined in later. When he brought other people into it, they had experiences. Yes or no? I'm sorry? Is that in the scriptures, yes or no? That that Joseph was alone when he saw God the Father and Jesus Christ? Yes. Yes, he was alone. He was alone. But he okay. had to open it up first. That's not a pattern at all. 
listeners what you think. That's your own witness, but nobody knows that. You know, God knows it, and I will never deny it. For my soul would be at stake if I did. So you can say it didn't happen to me, Mel, but if I say it, then I am accountable. You didn't witness it, okay. but I did. But your behaviors I, is not... Okay, correct. I understand that's what you, you believe you saw, but this is the thing, as I see, is that... Your behavior is not one of somebody Never being crushed. Your behavior. You your behavior. What? Never had any idea that you would be the person of all people to turn me. I'm me. asking questions, and I am concerned for you. That is what somebody does when they care. You don't sound like you're concerned. You sound like you're accusatory. You do not sound concerned. You sound pissed off. I'm not. I am, very, uh, I am troubled. Maybe that's the better word. Trouble. Because these things, like you being with Chad before he's even divorced, is unusual behavior for a person that's seen Jesus Christ. I was never with him and he was never divorced. Honey, I've seen you guys together. Oh, oh, so I haven't ever seen you with, I've never seen you with Chad kiss him and walk around the track at BYU with him. I never saw that. You say you're the one that's just feeling guilty about being with someone before they were divorced. Oh, honey. I think that's not what we're talking about here. Wait, it's not what we're talking about here. That's what I'm saying. You are going off the deep end. But well, I'm just saying, this is not a behavior of someone that sees Jesus Christ. It's not the behavior. Really? Have you ever seen Jesus Christ? So do you know what the future behavior would be if you had seen Jesus Christ? I know no. that when I have, I know that Every when I pray. Part of each of you every day, and he does protect me, and he is protecting me, and he will protect me against this accusation as well. And we will both stand there with him, and you tell me if I was lying or not, but we're both standing there with Jesus Christ. And that's the end of the audio, Your Honor. All right. Um, having heard the published audio then out of Exhibit 42, this would be a good time for us to take our mid-morning break. So we will take about a 20-minute recess and return for further testimony after that. All right, Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> we'll have the jurors brought back in.
All right, thank you. Please be seated. We're back on the record on case CR 2221-1624. Uh, we've got a witness, Ms. Gibb, who is testifying, however, not present in the witness box. Is the witness here? She is, Your Honor. Is the court ready for her to be brought in? I believe she's just in a room outside. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gibb, I'll remind you, you're still under oath for your testimony. Ms. Blake, you can continue the direct examination. Turn on my speaker. Thank you, Your Honor. Ms. Gibb, we just heard a recording that was made by you on December 8th of 2019. Could you clearly hear that? Yes. Do you recall why you made that recording? Um, I made it for several reasons. At first, I was trying to inquire the whereabouts of JJ for his safety. I also um, wanted to, you know, record her explaining how I didn't know anything about the whereabouts of JJ and any other information I could learn, like where they were, those, you know, just those kinds of inquiries. And why had you become concerned about the whereabouts of JJ? Um, because they initially told me that he was safe uh, with Kay, and then the police are now um, involved and questioning where JJ is. And she says, and Chad says that Kay doesn't have them, and so that that, that started to bring some questions to me, like what's really going on, but just not sure. Um, and some just, you know, thoughts with Alex talking to him and trying to get more clarification. And circling back, you indicated the last time you saw JJ would have been the night of September 22nd. Correct. And you stayed at Lori's residence that night, is that correct? That's correct. What room did you stay in? So she, she let me sleep in. Tylee's room, and then David slept in JJ's room, but I would often go back and forth. And so that night, I remember just being in David's room, which was in Tylee's room, um, JJ's room. Um, that's what I recall. So you were in that room with David for most of the night? I believe so. Do you recall if David had any kind of an issue that night, uh, health issues or otherwise? Yeah, he woke up very troubled from a dream that he had. And he just was in a really very uh, a heavy, um, just really felt um, his heart was racing. He was very kind of scared by the dream. Did you do anything at that point? I did. I um, got my cell phone and I text and or like I think I did both. I called Lori, called Chad. Uh, to see if they could maybe give him a blessing. Uh, I went to her door and knocked, or I don't know if I knocked on it, but I tried to open her door and it was locked. So I went back to the room. Did she respond to your call or your text? No. Did Chad respond to any attempts to reach him? No. And that was the night of September 22nd? Correct. And that's the last night you saw JJ? That's correct. And just to clarify, you ended up leaving the next day, do you recall what time of day you left? Yeah, I would say somewhere after 8 in the morning. And you did not see J.J. on the next morning? I do not recall seeing him. And then in November, you get the call about saying J.J.'s with you? Correct. And at that time, you learn he's not with Kay? That's correct. Did Lori ever tell you where he was? 
No. When you made that call on December 8th and you heard the audio, there's a few things in there that I wanted to go over with you. Okay. A comment is made um, that for someone who knows as much as you, that Lori can't believe that you're asking these questions, essentially. Yes. Do you know what she meant by that? Or what I, did you take yes, it to mean? I, I took it to mean that all the things that she had learned about multiple lives, multiple patients, all her teachings, all the teachings of Chad and her. Oh, sorry. And multiple probations about people being light, people being dark, those teachings, that's what she was referring to, and that's what how I understood it to be. And when you say those teachings, whose teachings were they? I think they originated from Chad. Did Lori also participate in teaching those things? She did. And we've talked about what religion you're part of. Correct. Are those the same teachings that are generally taught in the LDS faith? Absolutely not. <clears throat> and there's also a comment made that you're going to be accountable for the knowledge you do have. Right. What did you take that to mean? All the teachings that she taught, she felt that I would be accountable for all that, that she shared with me. And do you know, what did you take it to mean as far as who you would be accountable to? God. And there's another comment in there, and I think you say to her something along the lines of, for someone that has seen Jesus Christ or that sees Jesus Christ, do you recall making that comment? I do. Why did you make that comment? Um, her character, from my understanding of Christ, is when she was having her relationships with Chad and um, some deception and lying that was going on at times, um, and just her behaviors, um, being with him and also being married, that did not, to me, um, represent someone that would know Christ at that level. And when you say at that level, had Lori indicated that she had seen Jesus? She did. What did she indicate regarding that? She um, shared with me when she first met me that she had seen him in the temple and that he appeared to her. And as part of the LDS faith, do people sometimes say they've had revelations? People say they have revelations, yes. And would that be part of the regular teachings of the church? Yes. And if someone has revelations, do others sometimes turn to them for guidance or advice? People that have authority to do that, yes. So if Lori was seeing Jesus, would that potentially lead people to turn to her for advice? Uh, no, I don't believe so. Previously, we talked a little bit about some castings. Do you know who organized the castings that you participated in? Lori. Were there any assignments given during those castings? Um, I think she tried to talk to them about, you know, what they could potentially say during that time. Yeah. And when you say she, was that Lori? Lori yes. And we also talked about the light and dark scale. Yes. And I believe you indicated when asked about Tammy that maybe Tammy became dark close to the time of her death. Correct. Do you recall learning of Tammy Daybell's passing? I do. Do you recall what date that was? I believe it was in October, but I don't remember the date. Do you recall if you learned of it the day that she passed? I believe it was the day after she passed um, through a friend who sent a text to me to show me um, a, 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 you know, a, a little memo that she got from Facebook from Chad's account. And then she, just a friend, a random friend, sent it to me and said, look, what happened? That's how I learned of it. And when we talk about the day after, could it have been the day that it was announced or that it was reported? The day that it was reported, yes. Did you reach out to Lori at that time? I did. How did you reach out to her? 
I called her on her phone. Do you recall if you also texted her? I don't remember. When you talked to her on the phone, do you recall what time of day that was? It was in the morning. The early morning, mid-morning, if you recall? It felt like it was closer to mid-morning. Did she tell you about the passing or did you tell her? Um, I told her and then asked her more about it. Did she seem to have already known about it when you talked to her? She seemed uh, that she, had, she, she knew something was going on. She said that two of the girls from the group of women that we've discussed earlier um, had called her and inquired about that. Did you ask her any questions about it? I did. What did she tell you? I first asked her, I said, did you hear, did you know that, that Tammy died? And then I believe she, I don't know how she indicated, but, but because of the conversation she had with the two other ladies that she knew about it through them. And I'm sorry, what was the question again? Did, well, I asked it pretty broad, so I'll, I'll narrow it yeah. down. Did she tell you anything about what she knew regarding Tammy's passing? So I asked her what happened to Tammy, and she says um, that um, she had, a, yes, a dark entity in her, and they had to do what they could to get this that spirit out of her. And when she said they did what they had to do, did you know who she was referring to? Her and her and Chad. Do you recall if she indicated anything uh, regarding Tammy's knowledge of an affair or suspicion of an affair? She said she was starting to get suspicious. And by she was starting to get suspicious, was that Tammy? Correct. Did Lori indicate how she knew that? Um, I, I recall um, a conversation she had with me about um, Charles knew... Tammy, I mean, by phone, or something like there was some connection between their conversations and maybe another girl. I think it was uh, Christina understood that there was something wrong going on earlier on, and she might have shared some information. I, I don't know. It was it was a little bit of information uh, uh, Lori had shared with me. That's all I would have known is from her, but um, yeah, I think that's where it came from. Do you recall if Lori indicated how long Tammy had been suspicious of that before she passed away? I would say no longer than two weeks. Do you recall if Lori indicated how long Tammy had been possessed or dark before she passed away? Maybe it wasn't more than two weeks. So it was with it could have been less than two weeks, but it was a short period of time. So Tammy becoming darker, possessed, and her getting suspicious of the affair to the best of your knowledge, happened around the same time? About the fair part, I'm not sure. But the dark part is, yes. About two weeks before. Correct. Did Lori ever, I'll back that up, Charles is killed on July 11th of 2019. Is correct. that correct? Correct. Tammy is alive until October 19th of 2019 or about that time. Correct. In the meantime, while Charles has passed away and Tammy's still alive, did Lori ever indicate anything to you regarding uh, her relationship with Chad or any frustration? Yes, she was eager to um, move to Idaho to be with him. She was frustrated that Tammy had not passed on yet. She kept being told by um, her own personal revelation that she was supposed to pass away, according to Chad's as well, that she was supposed to pass away by now. Um, I remember one time they said she was supposed to get in a car accident, but she never did. Um, so she was feeling some frustration about being there, why he was still married to her. All right. We'll pause the proceedings for a minute. We've got a phone that went off, so we'll have the marshal take that. Thank you. Apologies, you can continue, Ms. Blake. Thank you. Thank you. 
when you talked to Lori after Tammy had passed away, did she indicate how she was feeling? Um, sorry, my mind's drifting a little bit. Um, um, she was very um, happy to move on and get married to Chad. She was very excited about being married to him and being with him. Do you recall her expressing any sorrow or sadness? No. Was it similar to the demeanor you'd observed shortly after Charles had died? Yes. And we talked about uh, some of these teachings of Chad and Lori's, and we've talked about the light and dark scale. Do you also recall anything being taught to you or told you regarding a trust scale? Um, little bit. Um, don't, I don't remember the words trust scale. Might have been another word, but yeah, that she had percentages on stuff like, yeah, some percentages, and I can't remember all the words, like if they're trusting or other words that would indicate their loyal, maybe their loyalty to them or maybe where they were spiritually. And when you say she had some skills, uh, who is she? Uh, Lori. Do you recall uh, ever being told anything about vibrations? Yes. And who told you about the vibrations? Lori told me. What do you recall her telling you about vibrations? And that vibrations had to do with um, it, what level of um, spirituality you're at. So, for example, if you're at, a, I think, a thousand vibrations, you were more in a higher spiritual level. They call it more terrestrial level. And when you're in these different levels, mm -hmm. uh, do you know what the vibrations were leading to as your vibrations increased? Um, they were leading to uh, more the body being translated and, yeah, mostly that is your body being translated and changed. <clears throat> and do you recall who had talked to you about the vibrations and the translations? Mm, Lori. Do you recall what you were told regarding if someone, while someone was becoming translated, what changes they would go through? Um, sometimes she would say she didn't have to eat uh, necessarily. Um, she didn't, I don't, like she would get younger. Uh, maybe her menstrual cycle would not be changed and things like that. So it could include physical changes. Correct. Would it be safe to say that these changes would take someone beyond the normal mortal body that we're given? Yeah, higher level of, yeah. Did Lori ever indicate if she had her own visions? Um, she was not one to claim so much of as a, as a visionary. I think she said she would have a dream here or there. Would she talk to you about what those dreams were? Yes. And was that similar to the dream she'd had regarding Charles dying? Correct. So did Lori believe that these dreams would actually come true? She indicated she believed it. <laughs> were these things also taught to Alex Cox? Yes. Did you ever have conversations with Alex Cox? I did. What was your understanding or what did he tell you regarding his belief in what they were teaching? Um, he, he gradually began to, to learn about it. Um, not, not in the beginning, but near, you know, more closer to the end of my relationship with them. And he, um, he really did believe that these entities were zombies now or or these this, the people that they were um, hoping would pass away he indicated that he believed they really were zombies and when you talk about the people they were hoping would pass away who is they um, Charles Tylee JJ Tammy and who was hoping they would pass away uh, Chad and Lori 
And you say Alex initially wasn't taught some of these things. Do you know the reason why? He just wasn't, you know, around the conversations in the beginning. Just he was kind of popping in and out of her house. And so it just wasn't disclosed in the beginning. But he believed in what Chad and Lori were teaching him. He did. And he truly, to the best of your understanding, he believed that people could become zombies. I asked him if I told him I didn't 100% believe it was true, and he said he 100% believed it. And in that recording from December 8th, you talk about a conversation you had with Alex. Correct. And I believe you said you asked him if you wanted to know what happened to JJ? Yeah. And what was his response? He says you don't want to know. And when you visited Lori in September, is that when she told you JJ was a zombie? Yes. Was Alex Cox there? Yes. If I can have just a moment, Your Honor. You may. I have no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Uh, who will be conducting cross-examination? I will, Judge. All right. Mr. Thomas, you can commence with your cross-examination. As we get started here, Mr. Thomas, I'll remind you and the witness both please to not talk at the same time in the cross-examination so we can keep the record straight. All right. That Thank you, mind, You can inquire. Ms. Gibb, um, you've uh, met with the prosecution on several occasions over the last couple of years, right? Correct. Okay. When was the last time you met with them? A few years ago. I don't remember. I don't remember a few years ago. So you didn't meet with them in preparation for this uh, trial today? Not physically. What does that mean? I, I didn't meet face to face with them. I, I met on Zoom, but I, I was thinking about when I met with the officers down there. That's what I'm referring to. Okay. Sorry, I. I wasn't thinking of just the the interactions I had with Lindsay on Zoom. I was just thinking about an interaction I had physically with them. What was the last interaction you had with uh, either Ms. Blake or one of the other prosecutors? It was um, I'm trying to remember what month it was. Was it? End of March, beginning of April, I believe. So this month? It could have been the very end of last month. Okay. Um, and did you go over your testimony with them? Yes. Okay. And prior to that, uh, when was the time before that that you met with the prosecution? It, seemed, it felt like it was back in Chandler a few, like, whatever, a year or two. I, I, I don't remember how long it's been now. It's been a while. Okay. Uh, when you went over this uh, with, you said, Ms. Blake, is that right? Correct. When you went over uh, your testimony with her, uh, were you as uh, forgetful as you've been today? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you recall writing a seven-page, uh, I guess I would say, outline uh, and sending that to Rob Wood? Um, I remember sending it to a few people. Um, most likely I did. Mm -hmm. Have you had a chance to go over that? No. No. You sent it back in July of 2020 and haven't looked at it since then? Oh, I might have looked at it during that month or two, but I haven't looked at it in a long time. Okay. I, I don't even... I don't know where it is. I can't find it, so I don't know where it is. 
Did you ask the prosecutors for a copy of it? Because they gave me a copy of it. Um, I asked um, Lindsay if they had some um, things that I'd share with Rob, like just like remembering points to help me remember different events, and I didn't receive it. Okay, but you asked for it. <laughs> I might have gotten an email, but I don't. I don't believe they were attached to it. I, I could be wrong, but I'm not recalling it. Okay. But I did get some things from her. You know, I know what the court's probably going to do on this, but I'm going to ask the court to uh, strike this witness's testimony based on uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 16b6. Uh, the state has had. Uh, Your Honor, I would ask for a sidebar. All right. There's an objection that's going to be argued. We've determined it would be more appropriate to argue this outside of the presence of the jurors. So uh, if all would please rise, we'll have the jurors excused to the jury room while this issue is sorted out. All right. Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> Mr. Thomas, you lodged an objection. Why don't you uh, indicate again the nature of your objection? I'll allow further response from the state. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the defense objects to the witness's testimony uh, based on uh, Idaho Criminal Rule 16, parens B, parens 6, uh, which, regarded, which regards uh, state witnesses. I'd like to read the rule just on the record, just so for appellate purposes, is that okay with the court? Yes. It says, uh, Paren 6 says, state's witnesses on written request of the defendant, the prosecuting attorney must furnish to the defendant a written list of the names and addresses of all persons having knowledge of relevant facts who may be called by the state as witnesses at the trial, together with any record of prior felony convictions of any of them that is within the knowledge of the prosecuting attorney and this is the pertinent part, Your Honor. The prosecuting attorney must also furnish on written request the statements made by the prosecution witnesses or prospective prosecution witnesses to the prosecuting attorney or the prosecuting attorney's agents or to any official involved in the investigation of the case unless a protective order is issued as provided in subsection 1 of this rule. It is my argument that the state received statements from Ms. Gibb that she just testified to, and she indicated that she met with the prosecutor, and the prosecutor did not turn over those statements. Are you talking about oral statements or the written seven-page outline she referred to? Oral statements. We received the seven-page outline. The oral statements I'm referring to are the statements made uh, to Ms. Uh, uh, Blake, over Zoom or anything else that she's uh, discussed with the prosecution. All right. What's the response to this objection from the state? Um, Your Honor, I think we've previously litigated this, and I understand counsel's desire to preserve the issue, but moving forward, the state would request any of these arguments be heard outside the presence of the jury. Um, that being said, I also have that rule pulled up, and I think there's simply a different interpretation being applied by defense than is intended by the rule. Uh, the rule does indicate that all statements of a prosecution witness or prospective witness known to the state have to be turned over. 
I do not think that rule contemplates somebody saying hi or something unrelated to the case being turned over. All statements have already been turned over. The state and the defense are allowed to meet with witnesses. They are allowed to do witness prep. If any new statements or new information is learned, I agree that rule requires those to be turned over. In this case, there was nothing new learned. All of the statements made, the testimony here today, are information that is well within the defense's possession. It has been turned over in discovery, the seven-page outline referenced by defense counsel, copies of prior testimony, transcripts of prior testimony, and police reports have all been turned over to the defense, which contain the information. There was nothing new learned, no new information obtained, no new statements made, which would require disclosure under Idaho Criminal Rule 16. So the state's position is we have absolutely complied with the discovery request, and the defense's attempt to broaden that requirement is simply not within the purview of the statute or the intent of the statute. So we would ask that defense's motion be denied. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. If you'll give me just a moment. I'm reviewing some authority here. And, Mr. Thomas, do you have any rebuttal argument after the state's argument there? No, Your Honor. All right. The court's reviewed the objection that's been made under Rule 16. It's a long rule. B-6. And considered some authority that governs that as well. The first issue is a practical concern I would have is the timeliness of this objection. If you're asking me to strike the witness, was that your request, strike the witness or the witness's prior testimony here? The witness's prior testimony. Okay. So you're asking me to tell the jury to disregard everything they've heard all day today. Well, Your Honor, unfortunately I made this objection yesterday or two days ago, and the court shot me down. And so I thought the only appropriate time to make this objection would be when I was here on cross-exam. Okay. I would find that impractical for purposes of this witness, obviously, with the jury having already heard the significant amount of the entire direct examination of the state. But further, looking at the rule itself, the rule does not preclude the state or the defense from meeting with witnesses who may be testifying at trial and preparing with them for testimony. I think the rule contemplates the issue I brought up with the seven-page outline someone has now. That would be a different story if you had not been supplied that, and the state had that in its custody and was not turned over. I'd see that differently. But there's been a record made that you did get that in terms of what the rule allows. It's to make sure that parties know who's going to testify, how to locate them, and any statements they may have made, such as statements made to police, witness statements that often come up in cases, those types of statements. And so looking at some case law, also State v. Montgomery, 163 Idaho 40, I think that the objection at this point is unfounded as it relates to this witness, and I will deny the motion to strike the testimony for both the practical consideration that she's already testified on direct as well as under Rule 16b-6. I just don't find that applies given the circumstances here. So that will be the court's ruling as it relates to this witness. And then going forward, Mr. Thomas, again, if you want to maintain the record, I understand that, and you can lodge the objection. Unless there's some written previously provided statements, I would likely be ruling the same way. So we'll just take those up with each witness if you think the matter needs to be raised. That will be the court's ruling then on the objection, and we'll have the jurors return to the courtroom so you can continue your cross-examination. Prior to that, may I just get that citation, Judge? Yes, it was 
State v. Montgomery, 163 Idaho 40, and that's a 2017 Idaho case. Thank you, Your Honor. You're welcome. All right, we'll have the jurors brought back. And just to not be disruptive, the next time a witness comes in, should I make the objection before the state calls or asks their first question, or how do you want me to do that? That probably is more effective in terms of making your objection if you want to continue to lodge it. Very good, Your Honor. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, that's another phone that just went off. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. All right, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Mr. Thomas, you can continue your cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. I believe, Ms. Gibb, you indicated that you first met Lori in October of 2018. Is that correct? Correct. All right. And that was at some sort of an event? I don't know that you actually said what kind of an event it was. What kind of an event was it? I was at a regular LDS church building, and there were classes, and I was teaching. So just in Sunday school type thing? It was like a Saturday. Well, maybe no. Maybe it was like more of a Relief Society night where they have a Thursday night evening meeting for the women. Okay. And you had met her there. Was Lori in your ward at the time? No. Okay. She was there with somebody else or just showed up? She showed up with her niece, Melanie. Oh, I see. And was Melanie in your ward? No. Okay. And you indicated that you had met Chad Daybell maybe two years before, a year or two before? Correct. Okay. And after meeting Lori in October of 2018, you guys became fast friends. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And so then you indicated that within a week or two of meeting Lori, that was the first time that you met Tylee and JJ? Correct. Okay. And the state was asking about the relationship between Lori and Tylee and Lori and JJ. How is it that you know anything about their relationships? What was your relationship with Lori? Very close friends. And for how long were you close friends? When I met her, which was in October, that's when we met for the first time. And so we became friends instantly. So October of 2018 to about October of 2019, you guys were really close? Correct. Okay. And would you see each other daily? Sometimes, but then it changed over time. Okay. It wasn't exactly daily, but it felt like it was so often. Okay. And when you would meet with her, what was that like? Would it just be like calling somebody on the phone and saying, hey, what do you want to do tonight? Or was it more of a during the day type thing 
what, what was what was the schedule like of your your relationship with Lori? How did that work out? Um, so she, she after I met her, she had my phone number, and so she communicated and asked me to meet her at places like the temple or we would eat lunch. That was basically where we met. Okay. And so, I mean, obviously the kids didn't go to the temple, right? Correct. So they, would they be there when you were eating lunch or something like that? No, I would go over to her house um, shortly after meeting her. Okay. Um, so you indicated that uh, J.J. sometimes seemed frustrated? Yeah. Uh, and you indicated that that was typical for a 7-year-old who has autism? Uh, to me it is. I mean, autism is a big spectrum, right? It is. Okay. Um, and so when you indicate that J.J. would get frustrated, I mean, did you – how how familiar – let me I'll withdraw that. How familiar are you with, uh, with autism and with the type of autism that J.J. had, his, his type of spectrum? I've seen different people in life um, – Small kids, in, in general, um, have autistic behaviors. Um, and so I could tell with the frustration, not being able to communicate quite like he wanted to, you know, getting frustrated, crying often mm-hmm. um, when maybe he didn't get his way or he was trying to maybe communicate or wanted to play with somebody, you know, just, just the inability to have relationships, uh, maybe like kids that don't have autism have. In your in your interaction with, with Lori and with her children uh, did you notice any type of a a schedule or a uh, a set uh pattern that that JJ would need to be on anything like that um he might have had a bedtime routine but i i, I wasn't aware enough to know how often their routine was i i wasn't around them you know that often so i don't i don't know Okay. Do you know that JJ went to a special school? Yes. I I don't know if it was a special school, but I know it was a really uh, nice um um what do you call it? Um a private school, so I don't I think they 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 had a section probably for autistic kids is my memory. Okay. Um and did Lori ever talk to you about JJ's routines, the things that he had to do before he went to school, anything like that? I don't recall. Okay. After uh, the day that Charles was uh, was shot and killed by Alex, uh, you were there with Lori, right? Later that day. No. No. The next day. No. No. Okay. Um. Had you ever gone with Lori to take JJ to school? It's possible. I don't recall, but it, it feels like I I have been. Feels like it. Okay. Do you know that JJ had a routine that he would get in the car, go get some French fries or chicken fries at at Burger King before he went to school every day? I don't recall that. You don't recall that. Okay. Um, you indicated on direct examination uh, that Lori had said something about uh, a belief in multiple lives or multiple probations. Is that right? That's right. Isn't it true that you said something to Lori about you felt like you had been on this earth four or five times? No. You never said that? No, she she thought that. That was her belief, not she, mine. She thought that you had been on Correct. the earth four or five times? Correct. And during the course of the year that you guys were close, you never, uh, you never bought into that. Um, at times. At times, you did buy into that—that that you had multiple lives, or you were. I wasn't sure, but she was very uh, convincing, and 
and uh, try to encourage me to believe it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about um, Lori meeting Chad for the first time. I think you indicated that that was, let me see, a couple weeks after the October 2018 visit. Is that right? When you when you met with Lori, it was. It could have been that weekend. I I don't remember exactly the weekend. It was in October. I know that. Okay, um, and then. A couple of weeks later, uh, there was a meeting at Lori's house where Chad was there, right? Correct. And you indicated that uh, Chad had spent the night there? Correct. Uh, did you also spend the night there? I did. And weren't there also all the other speakers who were speaking at that conference? Didn't they all spend the night as well? Uh, no, just uh, some people did, but not everybody. H how many people do you think spent the night there? Um. Maybe five or maybe six, about six people, I think. Okay. Sorry, we have another third time this morning, cell phone interruption. And we've been doing so well up until now. So <laughs> it's just been the morning for phones. Everybody, please make sure they're on silent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Apologies to interrupt. That's okay, Judge. Do you want to take a minute and let everybody turn their phones off or, or just make sure they're off? I'm, or are we good to just start, keep going? Let's just keep going. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Certainly. So there were multiple people who spent the night at Lori's house. This wasn't some uh, romantic encounter between Chad and Lori, correct? Um, I don't know what their... Um um, their desires for that connection at that time. I don't know what they were uh, trying to, what their conversations about why he was staying there. Um, but I know that there was some attraction. I, I'll just say that. Okay. But this wasn't a hookup, right? Um, I can't agree with that. You think that you and five other, at least five other people who were at this conference and chat were in the midst of Chad and Lori having a hookup that night. They were, they were acknowledging of it. I didn't say that. I'm talking about them. That, that was their own it. personal, whatever they had going up to get together. That was between them. But the other people, I don't think they were aware of what was going on. Okay. All right. And I believe you indicated that uh, Lori said that she had been through four or five different creations. Is that right? Yes. Four or five probations. I don't know how. I don't know. I, I used to know. I, I'm, I'm remembering five, but it, it seemed okay. like it changed again. I don't remember the number right now. Okay. And then you indicated that Lori had met with Chad in the temple with Moroni and Jesus Christ in the same room. Correct. And you had been to the temple with Lori on multiple occasions, right? That's right. And did this intrigue you at all? Which part? That that Lori was mar married to Chad by Jesus Christ and Moroni. I thought temple. it was very unusual and different. I, I didn't really know what to think about it. I wondered, like, is that really true? I, you know. And what, what temple was this? I, the Gilbert Temple. And is that the temple that you normally went to? Correct. And had you been uh, to the temple with Lori after this particular event? Yes, we went often, so yeah. And you never asked her to show you the place that she got married? No. Okay. Uh there was some testimony about uh, Lori having a special mission on earth, that being uh, part of the gathering of 144,000 people. Correct. Correct, yeah. Um, and you indicate that that was uh, biblically referenced, is that right? 
Correct. Okay. And then at some point, Lori believed that she was uh, one of the heads of the gathering of the 144,000. Is that right? That's right. Okay. And were you ever involved in or brought in to that gathering of the 144,000? Well, she would indicate that the girls that she knew were part of it. It wasn't given to us as knowledge on our own, just it's what she believed and Chad believed. Okay. Um, and did you believe that you were part of the 144,000? Mm, I, I wasn't sure. I, I didn't feel like it, but they kept trying to convince me that I was, but I didn't feel that calling ever. Okay. Um, but you were involved in, in what they call what, what has been referred to as castings. Is that right? Correct. And when, when you say castings, it kind of has a witchcrafty type of a connotation to it. Do you think or no? Or is that not what you um, think of? It, it didn't feel like that. So. Did it feel like biblically Jesus would cast out uh, devils and cast out evil spirits, and that's what you you guys were doing. Correct. Okay, so it was more like, not like casting spells. It was more like no. casting out devils by by using prayer. Correct. Right. Correct. And you were involved in some of these uh, uh, casting out of devils and and evil spirits uh, with Lori, right? Correct. Okay. And during the times that you were doing these uh, uh, these castings or, uh, or or casting out of, of evil spirits, did you ever feel like this was the wrong thing to do? Um, it, it felt very unusual. Um, it was very innocent to me. Innocent in the fact that you were just in a prayer circle, right? That you and whoever else were just praying about somebody. Correct. Or you were praying for um, the, the leaders of the world or the leaders of the church or uh, for hunger to uh, dissipate or something good to happen, right? No. No? You never prayed about that? Not that I have any memory of. Okay. All right. So when you were when you were doing these castings, uh, was it for specific people only? Yes. Okay. Now tell me a little bit about light and dark. I I have some knowledge, and I I think that this might be interesting to flesh out a little bit for the jurors. So tell me a little bit about light and dark. Can you, you indicated? I think. That someone can switch between being light and being dark. They they indicated that to me. Yes. They indicated that to you. Chad and Lori. Yes. All right. And you never believed any of that. Um, at times, I wondered if it was true. I wasn't one hundred percent convinced. Okay, but you were involved in the, in casting out of dark spirits, right? Yes. Okay, so you believed it, somewhat. Like I said, somewhat, but not completely. Okay. I don't think they believed it at first, too, because they didn't know what they were trying to accomplish. Well, when, when they were asking, when, when the prosecutor, Ms. Lindsay Blake, uh, was asking you about uh, who you had told about light and dark, and then that she specifically mentioned uh, the absence of Brandon Bedreau, you had said, and I... I I guess I can't quote you, but I think I think you said you said we, and then you corrected yourself, and then you said Chad and Lori were the ones who were who were doing that, right? They were in charge of doing that. Okay, but you had injected yourself, right? Um, it was just a an accident word. Freudian slip. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> You, 
you talked a little bit about the first casting out of of an evil spirit that you did involved Lori, Zulema, Christina, yourself, and somebody else. Is that right? I can't. I, I wasn't fast enough writing them down. Um, those people. Yes, I might. You know, I might have been more one more person. Who, who did was you the say, other person? Did you say Nicole. And, and I did not. So okay, that must no. have been the other person, huh? Who's Nicole? A friend of Christina's, which were both friends of Lori's. And was Christina there as well? Yes, yes Christina. Okay. Mm-hmm. And what's Nicole's last name? I'm not remembering. I didn't know her very well. Okay. What's Christina's last name? Atwood. Atwood. And was this casting done um, in someone's home, or was it done in the temple, or where was it done? Um, it was done in homes. Yes, I don't. I don't think it was done in the temple. Okay. And what what would this look like? I mean, what would a casting look like? Um, Lori would. We all. Uh, most, I guess, most of the time. Maybe not the first time, but generally it was just people standing up, and I don't remember people held hands or not. I don't remember that. Just basically kind of stood in a circle together or lined up around, you know, just being in the same room together. Mm-hmm. And then what would happen? And then uh, she would try to express her castings out by her um, knowledge that whatever she could think of, uh, maybe terminology that she gained from either energy work or maybe scriptural, those kind of things. I don't recall the words. And um, I think her friends uh, would try to come up with something that they thought was helpful, and it generally sounded like something you would s- say in energy work. I, that's what it. That's what I can how I can explain it. Okay, and what, what's your fam- familiarity with energy work? Um, so I've uh, I had a little bit of energy work done to me um, through a person who it's called a motion code, where they ask the body questions, and um, and often they would talk about how you were you know, connected to your ancestors or you had different emotions going on in your body and um, they would try to release it through their, they call it muscle testing, things like that. Um, but some of the practitioners would sometimes able to communicate with spirits on the other side uh, of the veil, like deceased ancestors or people like that. And so they kind of had their own language. Um, I was never an energy worker, so I don't, um, you know, remember all those words, but I just remember that that was my experience. So, so just to clarify, and I'm I'm still a little bit confused about what what went on in these castings. It, I, I think we established that it was a prayer, um, and each person would say a little part of that prayer. Is that how it would work? Yeah. Okay. And I and I believe you indicated something about disconnecting cords or trying to convince the spirit to leave the body. Yes. And it was all done with prayer. I, I think you can call it prayer. I. It's my best word. Okay. You're praying to God or your heavenly Father to try to help you to get this evil spirit out of this person or uh, heal this person or do something like that. Is that Correct. right? That's where that's where you were going with that. Yes. Okay. Because I don't I don't want to put any words in your mouth. I just. Okay. Let's talk about zombies. So um, there, you had heard Lori use the term zombie, right? Correct. This wasn't the first time that you've heard the word zombie, right? Well, it's a nation worldwide word, correct. Right, and it's been around for a while, at least the 1960s from what I can see, right? I believe so. I don't know when it started, but But you've heard it it growing up. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So when Lori talked about 
zombies, did you immediately think that they were going to die? No. No. Okay. What, what, what were your thoughts about that? Um, it was a bizarre teaching. I think I believe Lori thought it was bizarre at first, too. It was very um, something she'd never heard of in the context of how it was explained to her through Chad. Okay. Um, would it, do you recall uh, making the statement or writing down a statement indicating that Tylee had been a zombie since she was 12 or 13 years old? So, yes, but what that means is is when she was claimed to be a zombie, Chad would let her know that she truly became a zombie years ago. But that knowledge was, you know, she was sharing it as she was 16 or 17. She was saying that, oh, she became not a zombie right then, but she was. he was trying to say she had actually turned it when she was about 12 or 13. So that's what Chad said to you and Lori? To Lori. To Lori, and then Lori related to you. Correct. Okay. You indicated that uh, Brandon Bedreau was a dark spirit, is that right? Or he had a dark spirit? According to their beliefs, yes. Okay. And that he moved to even a higher level of darkness? He was part of Hitler's group during... The World War, is that right? Correct. Okay. And had you ever met Brandon Bedreau? I had. Before um, Charles's death? Yes. Okay. Did that jive with you, that he was a dark spirit? I thought it was, uh, it just was continually bizarre. There's moments where I, it was, they, you know, He's one minute this, and now he's this, and then he's really this, and then it would go deeper into just different explanations of how much they would change into darker. And and this was kind of an ongoing thing with different people? Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. I believe you said something about Tylee was told sometime between February and June that she was that she went dark. Is yeah, that right? Right. Okay. So she hadn't been a dark spirit the whole time. She just became dark between sometime between February and June of 2019. Yes. And in September of 2019, you were told that J.J. was possessed, right? Correct. Okay. Did you ever pray for Tylee or J.J.? No. No. Thomas, would this be a good opportunity to take our lunch recess? Sure, that'd be fine. Okay, we're just right before noon, so let's go ahead and do that at this time. Um, I'll talk briefly to Deputy Ravello as well. At the end here, we'll break for lunch and uh, shoot for our 45-minute lunch. Hopefully be back around 1245 to resume with your cross-examination. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated.
Okay. We'll go back on the record on case CR 22-21-1624. Appreciate everyone going quick on their lunch break, I know, so we can maintain our schedule to stop at 3.30 uh, or thereabouts. So we'll uh, let the jurors be brought back in, and then you can continue with your cross-examination, Mr. Thomas. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Everyone, please be seated. All right, we are back on the record on KCR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Ballo. We just concluded the lunch break for the day. Mr. Thomas is conducting cross examination 
of the witness, Melanie Gibb. If you'd like to continue with your cross at this time, you can, Mr. Thomas. Good afternoon, Ms. Gibb. Good afternoon. Um, so before the lunch break, we were talking a little bit about um, dark energies and uh, those kinds of things. Um, we talked about the fact that uh, sometime between February and June, uh, Tylee had gone dark. You, you recall talking about that? Yes. Okay. Um, and then <clears throat> sometime in September, you were also told that JJ was possessed. Is that right? September, yes. Okay. And that was September of 2019? It was around that time, whenever I flew in. I think it was the 19th. Okay. Um, and when they said possessed, you, you took that to mean that he was possessed by some sort of an evil spirit? Correct. Um, let's see here. We kind of bounced around a little bit. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, um, the shooting of Charles Vallo on July the 11th. Uh, you indicate that you had talked to Lori about that particular event. Is that right? Correct. And, um, Lori had told you uh, that she did not witness the shooting. Is that right? I just don't recall if she said she did or she didn't. Okay. But you understand that there was some sort of an altercation? Yes. And that altercation was between Alex Cox and Charles Vallow? Correct. Okay. And Lori wasn't involved in the altercation, to your to your knowledge? Um, she, there was a lot of verbal um Communication between the two of them. I don't know if there was any physical. I'm not recalling that part. Okay. So when you stayed at Lori's house in mid mid September, I believe you said it was September 19th, 2019. Um, you said you did not see Tylee. Is that right? That's correct. Isn't it true that? You and Tylee didn't necessarily get along? We didn't have a relationship. Okay. Uh, she, she didn't particularly like you, right? She didn't indicate it, she did, that she did like me. Okay. And you didn't particularly have any kindness towards her? That's not true. You did? I was kind. I'm always kind. Okay. So, okay, so tell me a little bit about... You being kind to Tylee, what, what what did that look like? When I tried to uh, introduce myself, she wouldn't really look at me. She kind of rolled her eyes and looked away and didn't seem happy that I was there. She didn't know me. It was just first time, you know, she'd ever heard of me that I know of. And so just from the very beginning, she didn't like me. And that kind of continued throughout the time that you knew Lori? Yes. And one time I tried to be nice to her. We were sitting at, like, um, like a little restaurant and... I think I was trying to help brush her hair off her arm or something, and she didn't particularly care for that. Okay. But I had empathy for her, so. Um, going back to the death of Charles, um, I believe you testified on direct examination that Lori had told you the day before Charles had passed away that uh, if Charles was to die, then the money would go to Kay. Is that right? Yeah, um, I think that's how I worded it. Sounds right. Okay, but you you knew that information prior to Charles's death. Yes. Okay, and so there really wouldn't be any incentive monetarily for Lori to be involved in in Charles's death, right? Um, I no, I don't think that's true. I think there was well, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure exactly how the the wording was with the. Um, I think it. She was starting to see that the, it was changed, the money was changed uh, right up into that point. Um, so I don't know if that there, no, that's not, there would have been an incentive if he would have, no, that would have been, I'm just trying to clarify my own mind, so mm -hmm. sorry about that. Um, 
Yeah, I don't, I don't know if there would have been. Okay. But you knew prior to him dying that, that the insurance policy had changed the beneficiary to K? Yes, just prior. Okay. Thank you. We, you talked a little bit to the prosecuting attorney about um, why Chad didn't get a divorce, and you indicated that either Chad or, or Lori, somebody, told you that he would be penalized, he would lose his exaltations if he got divorced. Correct. What, what did you mean by that? Who told you that? That's what Lori told me. Okay. And so... So the, the logic was he was just going to wait for her to die naturally and carry on this affair with Lori? That that was the, the idea. Okay. <clears throat> Another thing that I had a question about... Um, you were talking to uh, the prosecutor today, and uh, we talked a little bit about uh, Lori telling you to tell the police that uh, you had J.J., right? Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. And um, the police had called you, and there was no answer. You didn't, you didn't pick up the phone right away? Correct. How many times did they call you? Do you remember? Um, it felt like it was two times the Idaho police call. Okay. And did they leave a message or they text you I, or? I believe they, I believe they did. It could have been both. Okay. Um, and you, you told them, and I'm just going to quote it as best I can from what, what I remember you saying, uh, I had him, but I don't have him anymore. Is that right? I didn't tell the Idaho people that. Okay, who did you tell? That was uh, that was Gilbert Police. Okay, but you did tell them that you had JJ at one point, but you didn't have him anymore. Correct. That Lori had come and picked him up. Correct. Something like that. Okay, and that wasn't the truth. That wasn't the truth. Okay, and then did the conversation go on from there with the Gilbert Police? Uh, just small talk, but nothing, nothing significant. I just told him I was going, you know, back to Arizona the next day and my plans for Thanksgiving. So wh- where were you when that phone call was made? I was in Utah, and I was in the process of going down um, to Arizona to have Thanksgiving. Okay. So you were living in Utah? No. No. What were you doing in Utah? I was visiting my boyfriend. Okay. And that's David Warwick? Yeah. Okay. Is, are you guys... Did you ever get married to him or no? No, we're married. Oh, you're married now? Yes. Okay. Um, and so you were visiting him. That's when you got the phone call, and that's when you said you had him, but you don't have him anymore, and you're indicating that that was not the truth. Correct. Okay. And then you contacted law enforcement a second time, and that was... After you had made the recording that we had just heard, exhibit number 42? I'm not sure um, so you, how you many ma- times I, I just know I contacted them after I recorded it. Okay. So you recorded it and then you contacted them? We had talked prior to that, but when I, after, because that's who I knew how to, who to send it to, is because I already contacted Officer Pillar, so I knew to send it to him, so I let him know that night after I recorded it, if I could send it to him, or if, should I send it to the Idaho people, what should I do, and just said to, e- I think, email it or send it. So did somewhere. you, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, did you and Officer Pillar uh, decide that you were going to record this phone no. call? Oh, no, no. But you had talked to Officer Pillar about doing this? No, I just had a contact with him and communicated with him, um, you know, saying I need to come and talk to you. I can't remember if I, I'm trying to remember the dates, if I had talked to him already, but it had nothing to do with the recording. Yeah. Okay. And you indicate that one of the reasons that you made the recording was so that uh, you would be able to have some sort of audio proof that you didn't know anything about where J.J. was? That's one of the reasons. Okay. So it was was a self-serving phone call? It was a multi-serving. 
I'm sorry? It was a multi-serving purpose. Okay. But part of it was self-serving? Par partially. Yes? Yes, partially. Okay. And during that recording, at one point you said uh, you would be safe if you hadn't opened dark portals. Your salvation is in trouble. My salvation is not in trouble. Do you recall saying that? I don't remember saying my salvation wasn't. I, I, I don't remember exactly, but I remember the first part, what you said, is that her salvation was in trouble. What about the, about the dark portals? Yeah. Can, yeah. You tell, can you tell us about, a little bit about the dark portals? What does that mean? Sure. Um, so they often talked about creating portals. Um, so Chad would explain to Lori how to make a portal so that they could. Um, sh hers was in her closet. I, don't, I think his was on his bed or in his room somewhere. And that they could communicate through some kind of ability to communicate through a portal. Uh, not that you could physically see anything, but it was something that they would make up um, in a spiritual realm in their in their mind, and that they would be able to communicate. Um, and so they were participating in that kind of ideas. So that's how I would explain it. Did you have a portal? No, no. No? No. Okay. You also talked about um, Korahor in that in that uh, in that uh, phone call. Who who is Korahor? Yes, I did talk about Korahor. He is a antichrist found in the Book of Mormon, uh, in the Book of Alma. Um, he um, was going around preaching of um, the idea of an anti or he was antichrist. He was teaching against the idea of a. a, a of a, a Christ coming to our world. And um, after he had questioned the prophet Alma, um, you know, questioning him and saying, show me a sign that there is a Christ, he wanted proof. And he said, well, if it's God's will, you will be struck dumb. And so he struck dumb. And after he was struck dumb, he said that he was um, mis he was deceived by a by Satan or the devil in, in the form of an angel, and that he taught him some teachings um, that were pleasing to the carnal mind, insomuch that he had much success and convinced and convinced himself that they were true. That's what I was referring to. And so you're referring to her as an antichrist? Yes. Okay. You also mentioned Alma in there. That's also, Alma is also a a person in the Book of Mormon? Correct. He's a person that believes in Christ as a prophet. Okay. And sh you also mentioned, uh, I believe, Joseph Smith in that in that uh, phone call, or she, Lori did, one of the two of you, and he is also someone who is connected with the Book of Mormon? Uh, in translating it, he, Joseph Smith was. Okay. So all of the characters that I hate to say characters, people uh, that are in the conversation that you were talking about uh, biblically or, or sp scripturally, uh, those were all either from the Book of Mormon or from the Bible? I believe they were all from the Book of Mormon. Okay. I'm pretty sure. You talked a little bit about talking to Lori... Uh, the day that Pam, that Tammy uh, passed away, Tammy Daybell, you recall that? Yes. And uh, where where was Lori when Tammy had passed away? Do you know? She told me she was in Hawaii. Okay. Do you have any reason to believe she wasn't in Hawaii? No. Okay. The prosecutor asked you a little bit about light and dark scales and trust scales and loyalty uh, to to different people. Um, and then you went in and talked a little bit about vibrations. So tell me a little more about um, these vibrations. Is that a, is that a new con was that a new concept for you that Lori was telling you about? Um, the idea of having a vibration high enough to be translated as a being, yes, that was a new idea. 
Okay. Um, this wasn't part of uh, energy work or those kinds of new age type of beliefs? The word vibration is is common amongst I would say alternative or energy work, um, but the realm in which they discussed it was at a different level, so it had a new kind of a meaning to it. That was how I interpreted it. Okay. And so ha- had you been involved in or had training or experiences with vibrations as far as energy work or as far as the new age or new uh, age concepts? Uh, the only thing I could probably think of is maybe doing some yoga, but we didn't really kind of talk. I mean, they talked about vibration a little bit, about, you know, highest vibration is like love or peace, something like that. So this isn't something totally new to you? It's not totally new. Okay. Um, just to end, I would like to ask you a little bit about Alex Cox. And um, you, in, you indicate that uh, at some point he had totally bought into the zombie uh, zombie concept, right? Correct. And that you specifically said he had 100% believed, believed it was true. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Um, and then you had asked, I, will, I believe it was you that asked, uh, what had happened to J.J.? Is that right? Did you ever ask Alex that? That's right, I did. And what did Alex say? He says, I said, do you want... Do I want to know what happened to him? And he said, you don't, you don't want to know. And then what was the conversation after that? Um, he talked about how the police came to his apartment, took his guns. They were really evil people, the police people were. And then Melanie was there, and she talked about how she was, her house was broken into, too. They took her money or something like that. And then, then Alex talked about um, getting ready to go on a honeymoon or, you know, like get married to Sulema. And, um, and and anyway, we we just kind of talked about a bunch of stuff. And then he talked about how Chad had given him a, like a patriarchal blessing and talked about how, you know, he felt he was very, um, it was a very touching blessing for, for Alex and very emotional about it. Um, and then we met up with Sulema, you know, during part of it, because you know she she was just on the walking way towards her house, and and then we talked about um, a little bit what was going on up there in Rexburg, just you know the police and this and that, and I don't know those kind of things. But it it, it seemed like everything kind of revolved around. Where was JJ? We're looking for JJ, right? There was a little talk about that, but then they changed the subject and talked about what was going on and how they were being chased and those kind of things. Why, why do you think they were being chased? Well, that's what I asked them. I didn't understand why they were, and they just said that evil was after them. Okay. So basically you asked, do I want to know what happened to JJ? And they said, no, you don't want to know. Yeah. And that was Alex. And Was anybody else there? Uh, Melanie was there. Um, Melanie who? Um, Pulowski. Okay. She was there when that was said? Um, she was there. I don't know if she's right next to me, but she was, you know, they were both together, so. Okay. Yeah. And he, he just kept skirting the issue of, I'm not going to tell you where, where JJ yeah, is? Yeah, he didn't announce it. And then later I'd ask Sulema, like, what did he mean? What does that mean? And she's like, and she had asked him because she didn't understand either what had happened to JJ, and he told her that um, that they couldn't be found. And so when I questioned her about it, I said, "I'm very concerned about this." So I asked her what he told her. Okay, thank you. I have no further questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. Redirect. <clears throat> Let's 
So you were asked about a couple things that I just want to go over with you again. Okay. Um, you were asked about Timely not liking you. Correct. And I think you indicated uh, that it didn't seem like she liked you. Had you been around other teenagers before? Yes. Had you seen other teenagers have an attitude? Sure. Did there, was there anything about Tylee's behavior that you thought was completely out of the ordinary for a teenager? Um, it, if you have some teenagers that are ornery and disrespectful, then she would fit into that category. Yeah. And I talked to you a little bit before about Tylee's interactions with her mother, Lori. Yeah. Did you observe similar behaviors towards Lori from Tylee? Um, Lori was generally pretty calm around her. She usually didn't react um, with her, you know, disrespect. She tried to make friends with her most of the time. Did you observe Tylee being disrespectful to her mom at times? Yes. During this time, were you, was this towards the time that you were spending quite a bit of time with Lori? Yeah. Well, yes, just throughout, was, you know, throughout because she moved and, you know, wherever she was, usually Tylee was with her. I think um, they may have brought this up, but where did you spend Christmas of 2018? Do you recall Christmas who's, Day um, or just around Christmas? Did you go to anyone's house? Um, it seemed like I did something with Lori and her family, but I don't remember exactly what day it was. And throughout your friendship with Lori, did you travel with her? I um, not in the airplane, but I flew to visit her in Hawaii and then I went by myself and then by myself I flew to see her in Texas. And when you went to see her in Hawaii, do you recall approximately when that would have been? February, I believe, the end of February 2019. And did you spend time with her there? Yes. Did you notice anything with regard to whether or not she was in contact with Chad Daybell? Yes, she was. Was that pretty consistent contact? Yes. Daily? Yes. And do did you overhear conversations? Um, I would hear a little bit. I, she often would sit in the balcony and talk to him for a while, and then she, we'd go to the beach and she would talk to him. And if we were at lunch or breakfast, she may have received phone calls from him. But I, I knew she was in correspondence. Was that a daily thing? Yes. And in February of 2019, both Charles and Tammy were alive. Is that correct? Correct. Did you also uh, do podcasts with Lori? I did. And how often did you do the podcasts? Um, it seemed like they were once a week, and then maybe it changed to maybe once. I, it changed. I, I, I don't recall. Maybe once a month to once every few weeks. I, it kind of changed a bit. She wasn't on all the podcasts. And... You were asked uh, about JJ and what if he had any special services. Do you recall if JJ had a service dog? He did. Did Lori ever tell you if that dog went with them to Idaho? No, I don't believe so. You know, this is beyond the scope of, of direct or cross. I will sustain that. We're outside of the scope of direct. Did Lori tell you that you had been on the earth before? Yes. And you were asked some more things about the temple. Is the temple related to the LDS faith? Yes. And when, um, before I'd ask you about sealings a little bit, uh, sealings done at the temple, do sealings generally take place in the temple? Yes. And is that part of the LDS yeah, on faith? The scope of cross. I'm going to object. That will be overruled. That went into on cross, so you can continue, Ms. Blake. Are marriages common in the temple for the LDS faith? Yes. Did you want to believe Lori? Um, I think sometimes. She's very convincing. You were asked about 
Tylee being a zombie at the age of 12 or 13? And I th- believe you indicated that Chad had told Lori that? I believe it was him, yes. And then you said Lori told you that Tylee became dark between February and June of 2019? Um, Are those right dates? Well, no, or was it was it? like, um, I said between February and June, but as I was pondering, I think, I, I remember, it, I definitely remember when I was in Texas, she talking about it. So whenever I was in Texas, which I think it was in April or May. And if someone was a zombie, was it your understanding that Chad and Lori would say that person was already dark? Yes. So was was this an example of some of the inconsistent teachings done by Chad and Lori? When you say inconsistent, what do you mean? I think you talked about that it would evolve and kind of change. Oh, was this right. an example of that? Yeah. You were asked about the switch in the life insurance policy regarding Charles. Could you have learned about that switch after Charles' death? No. Did you see Lori and communicate with her in the days after Charles' death? Did I see her? Did you see her or communicate with her in the days after Charles had passed away? Yeah, about, about probably four days after he passed away, she contacted me. And I don't, I don't know if I saw her like the day after that or something. And you were asked uh, about that phone call and whether or not it was self-serving. Did you have concerns that someone would try to falsely accuse you of something? Yes. Who did you think may falsely accuse you of something? John and Lori. And you said that was only one of the reasons for the call. What Correct. was the other reason again? I wanted to find out if I could find the whereabouts where JJ was. Who did you believe would have the information as to where JJ was? I believe Lori would have known because that's her son. Did you turn that recording over to the police? I did. At the time that you made that call on December 8th, did you believe things Lori had taught you anymore? No. Did you at that time believe she was teaching false things for her own personal gain? Yes. You were asked about some of the concepts such as vibrations not being completely new words or new terms. Yes. Were some of the teachings of Lori linked or based on terms that were more mainstream? Uh, they could have originated from them through different energy workers to different things they'd heard through the alternative field and, and then it led into other things. And you were, uh, do you, in your opinion, did that make it easier to believe them? Yes. You were asked about the term zombie as well. Correct. And you've heard the term zombie before Lori told it to you. That's right. And had you ever heard the term zombie in the way that Lori used it, though, before she told you? No. Was your understanding of the way they use zombie that the body of that person was still alive? I'm trying to figure out how you're asking. Hold on. I can make sure I understand your question. Say that again. I can phrase it different. That might be helpful. The way that they, the way that Lori told you, how zombies worked is the person's spirit would be pushed out of their body. Right. Would, and the body would still be alive. Right. And is that the way that they use zombie to you? That's the way they used it. Correct. They weren't using it in the term that, would you say it was in the way you'd heard the term before, such as in a horror movie? No. It had a different definition attached. Yes. I think before you mentioned that Chad and Lori wanted, if they wanted people gone, those people became zombies. Yes. At some point, did you start to observe a pattern as to what was happening when someone was deemed a zombie? Yes. And what pattern did you start to see? Uh, the pattern I start to see is when people uh, in her you know, personal life or close to that personal life, they started questioning her. I'm not happy with the situations that were going on. 
uh, w- between her and her and her niece, and um, and so um, sorry, I'm, I'm just losing my train of thought a little bit. Um, ask, please ask a question again. Um, so I was talking if you started to see a pattern evolve yes. with when someone was deemed a zombie yes. and what that pattern was. Right. So the pattern was as, as soon as they started questioning her or, you know, just thought something suspicious going on, all of a sudden that person became dark or a zombie. And when you talk about someone, um, people that they wanted gone were deemed zombies, when they would deem those people zombies, were those people gone? Uh, most of them. Not every single person. But did they deem Charles a zombie? Yes. And when I say they, I guess I should be specific. Did Lori deem Charles a zombie? Yes. Did Lori refer to Tammy Daybell as a zombie? I believe so. I she probably used that word, but I'm not 100%. I think so. Did she refer to Tammy as being possessed? Yeah. Yeah. Did she refer to Tylee as a zombie? Yes. Did she refer to JJ as a zombie? Yes. And we talked before, um, to the best of your understanding, Alex Cox believed what they told him. Correct. He believed what Lori told him about zombies. Correct. Do you know, did you ever observe Alex's relationship with Lori? Yes. Could you describe their relationship? They seemed very close. Um, they j- joked around a lot with each other. Uh, they seemed to be there for each other. Do you know if at any point Alex was given a special designation as to what his purpose on earth was? Yes, it was um, to basically be her protector. Did you observe or do you know if Alex would do what Lori asked him to? I felt that he would. I mean, I don't know 100% everything she told him to do. I think we talked about, uh, you'd indicated Lori had told you she was going to ask Alex to stay with her the night before Charles was shot by Alex. That's right. And Alex stayed the night? Sorry. Um, Judge, I'm going to object. I never went into any of this on cross, and so um, she's just redirecting for her own benefit, for redirecting, not has nothing to do with the cross exam. Uh, I do agree. We're outside of the scope again of where we went with both direct and cross at this point. So I'll sustain that. And Miss Gibb, you were asked if you met with the prosecutors prior to today. Yes. And if you went over your testimony with the prosecutors. Yes. And you indicated that you did meet with me. Yes. Do you recall, um, did it, during the prep, did that influence your testimony today? No. Do you recall me discussing with you that all we ask you to do is tell the truth today? Always. And is that what you've done today? Yes. I have no further questions. All right. Thank you, Ms. Blake. Any recross, Mr. Thomas? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That will conclude your testimony then, Ms. Gibb. You can go ahead and step down. Um, does the state have another witness to call at this time? Your Honor, the state's next witness is Detective Duncan. Okay, if you could give me just a moment. I'd like to, off the record here, just a quick sidebar only with my court reporter for a second to discuss how this device works. So we'll do that. Judge, before we get started again, I forgot to inquire. May Miss Gibb be released? Any objection? No, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, she can be released then. That will conclude her testimony. Thank you.